record. That's correct. I'm not a perfect person. That's correct. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Correct. Yes, that's billion with a B. Take a chill pill, man. It's the butter cow, which has nine hearts to represent the nine essential nutrients in milk. That's right, it's made entirely out of butter, and it, you know, it's a state fair tradition since at least 1922. All right, everybody, I think we're ready. How about that new music? Huh? Oh, man, that is so trippy. I'm like, whoa, dude, I thought it was back in the 70s. No, no, 2019. I, oh, I love that, though, man. It took me back. <laughs> Did it? Yeah, man, it was Sounded so futuristic. trippy. It's like back in the room. Mm, man. Oh, then, then you brought Muller come in and Rom. This little light of mine with Lori. Good stuff. All right, everybody, your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, December 26th is just moments away. But before we get into all that, we need to thank the following unions for jumping on board and sponsoring this program. Unions like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace, not Aerosmith Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. A giant thank you to those unions for jumping on board and sponsoring this program. And, of course, today's show for Thursday, December 26th, is brought to you by the Chicago Federation of Labor. Live stream chat room. Let's hear you weigh in if you're listening right now. Uh, and if you can hear us, let us know if you can hear our song of the day. Ben Jarofsky, let's oh. hear that song of the day. It's a sunny day outside, so I'm singing Bobby Hebb's classic from the 60s. Sunny. Oh, thank you for the sunshine. You gave, now I'll do Stanley Turrentine's version. Okay. He's a sax player. <laughs> oh, oh live stream has got that saxophone there. That was great. I actually heard that this morning. All right, we're good. Brianna, Chica or Brianna says, uh, welcome back, everyone. No sing. <laughs> Okay, Brianna, you have a good point. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Thursday, December 26th, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, a Jeffrey Epstein update and more with attorney Leonard Goodman. And it's the return of the director of the Black Harvest Film Festival, the one, the only, Mr. Sergio Mims. And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist, Benny J. Benjarovsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this. Get off your duff, Democrats. Thursday. I forgot what day it was, D. And oh, here's boy. why. Merry Christmas, everybody, or Merry Day After Christmas, uh, everybody. You have a nice Christmas, D? Yeah, it was good. All right, Santa take care of you? <laughs> yes. Ho, 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 huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Anyway, this place is empty. My, my beloved bright one, no one's here. It's just me and D, hardest working uh, podcasters in the business. Let's see, uh, is Joe work? Joe Rogan working today, D? Uh, where you going? <laughs> 
Every now and then, Dennis just gets up and like, where you going? We just started. The door wasn't shut all the way. Oh, I see. Joe Rogan, is he working at AD? No. I don't think so. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Jimmy Dore working at AD? I huh? mean, they maybe. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. I bet they are. How huh? about your guy, Timmy Dillon? Is he working today? Uh, no. I didn't think so. How about your guy, Mark Maron? Is he working today? Uh-uh. I mean, maybe. We're working. You know why we're working, folks? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to let you in a little inside story about how this show works. I said... <laughs> I said, you know, Dennis, uh, I think I'll just take uh, the whole Christmas week off. You know, just chill out and uh, just sit by the fire. Well, there's no fire, but I'm going to pretend there's a fire. And he goes, you get in there and you're going to do some work because oh, yeah. that's how we do it. And that's how it works around here. I go, but I, I kind of wanted to get in there. D Dr. D is a lot tougher. That's that me. little nice guy from Alton, uh-uh, negatory. Get in there and go to work. Anyway, it's gonna be a, today's gonna be interesting. I forgot the part where I called you a douchebag. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot that. Right, wait a minute, you you're not supposed to say that because remember you tell me I can't. Is that a swear? Nah. Okay. Anyway, so um, it's gonna be an interesting show tonight, folks. Uh, I was up until three thirty this morning reading. Uh, I was reading a great book uh, by Richard Rousseau. It's a memoir about his mom. And then I was like, I was plowing through this book. I would have been up all night. It would have been no. So I, so I said, I have to switch. So I did. And I picked up the book uh, on Obamacare, which I've been reading. You know, everybody, I've been reading the history of the first uh, year or two of uh, Barack Obama's reign when I was blissfully unaware of what was going down because I wasn't paying attention. Let there be a lesson out there for everyone. Anyway, so I started reading the facts and figures of healthcare in this country. Next thing you know, they, so that, that book helps. If it's 3.30 in the morning, that's a tip. Uh, if you're really having a hard time falling asleep, read a book on Obamacare, and that'll do the trick. Anyway, before I fell asleep, some couple points I've been raising, and I want to say them again. Barack Obama, in that first year that he was in office, just completely laid down and let other Republicans walk all over him. That's basically all I got to say. It was, there's no red states, there's no blue states, it's we're all in this together. And so in terms of health care, the first thing they said when, oh, I give him credit. He said, we're going to have health care. So let's give him credit. Let's show him some love for that, D, okay? We're going to have some kind of health care program. First thing he ruled out, Medicare for all, out the window. Anything that would benefit the great majority of Democratic voters, working class people, poor people, people who are like don't have jobs at the moment or people whose jobs don't provide health care. Anything that would help them, the base, in other words, open window, throw out. OK, because why? He was chasing the illusion that somehow or other Republicans would join up with him if he put forth a health care program that was very similar to the one that Mitt Romney created when he was governor of Massachusetts. Guess what, folks? Not one Republican signed on with Obama on that health care, and he took every single Democratic vote he could get. He was sp talking about how, you know, we work together, it's going to be bipartisan. The Republicans fought him every step of the way, and they were fighting from the moment he walked into office. They chased the illusion of bipartisanship, and that's an illusion that has cost us as a country very dearly. This notion that somehow or other this Republican Party can be counted on to do the right thing, to implement the programs that their very people like Mitt Romney endorse when they're governors of states like Massachusetts is an illusion. And Barack Obama wasted that first year chasing that illusion. He got reelected in 2012, but essentially the seeds were sown for Donald John Trump because many people across the country came to the conclusion that push come to shove, you can't depend on the Democrats to do the right thing. I hear this all the time, D. All right. And I, you know, I, I have a confession to make. I really want to do I wasn't paying attention as much as I should have been in 2009 when this was going down. I was fixated on Chicago politics, D. Okay, there's my excuse. I was trying to keep uh, the Olympics from coming to town. You're welcome, Chicago. I saved you billions of dollars uh, on that debacle. So, you know, I was focused on local Chicago stuff, wasn't really paying attention as much as I should have been. And now here it is, 10 years or so later, I'm like, oh my God. It's like the same people who are running the city of Chicago during the ROM years, well, ROM being one of them, uh, were running the Obama White House uh, in 09 and 010, and they weren't listening to the base of the Democratic Party. They opened the window and threw out uh, Medicare for All. Anyway, so this is what I'm reading. I'm up all night reading this stuff, D. All right? 
Then I wake up and go out about my day. At Christmas Eve, go out to uh, to a lovely Chinese uh, dinner in Chinatown. Had a great time with a bunch of friends. And there was a young man there, and we'll just call him Johnny. All right, D? We're just going to call him Johnny. We're having this conversation. It's not me, by the way, guys. It's definitely not Dr. D, okay? Uh, and Johnny says he is 95% certain that Donald Trump is going to win re-election. He's really sad about this because he doesn't want Donald Trump to win, but he's sitting there and goes, he's going to win. That's all there is to it. You know, and I got to tell you, folks, I've had so many conversations with Democrats like this over the last couple weeks, months, et cetera. Uh, Democrats are intimidated right now. Uh, they see images of Donald Trump's rallies uh, in uh, places. Well, they just had one in Michigan, uh, filling up arenas with uh, red hat, MAGA hat, red color MAGA hat wearing uh, Donald Trumpster fans cheering him on. They read his tweets, his trash talk, talking tweets. He just seems, he seems uh, impervious to any of the normal criticism that brings down uh, uh, politicians or forces them to accommodate or make adjustments in what their uh, their plans are. He's he he is completely indifferent uh, or hostile no collusion. to yeah to the uh, impeachment proceedings as though he, they're of no matter to him. Uh, he's got Mitch McConnell in the Senate saying uh, we're just going to work in concert with the White House on the strategy to make a mockery of the impeachment trial. So it just seems like Donald Trump is a brain. Democrats are are just so scared now. It's like, we can't beat him. He's going to win. Oh, no. Woe is us. And I tell you what, folks, this is what I say to that. Number one, you don't know that. I mean, Johnny, as much as I love him, he doesn't know. Well, he's just like, I think, I think Trump's going to win. I don't know he's going to win. It's just, I think he's going to win. But secondly, and more important, if you're worried about Trump winning, there's something you could do about it. You can go up to the state of Wisconsin, just to the north of us, or go over to the state of Michigan, swing states, just to the east of us, and go knock on doors. We had Marge Halpern on the show not too long ago from Indivisible Chicago. They're organizing people to go out to these swing states in the mid Midwest that the election will hinge on. Instead of sitting around, crying about how Trump's going to win, feeling sorry for yourself, Democrats, you get up and do something about it. 2020 is around the corner. You should commit yourself. If you believe that Donald Trump is a threat to this country, then you should get off your duff and do something about it. And you shouldn't be, I hate to say this, like Barack Obama in 2009 and just roll over and let the Republicans get away with whatever they're getting away. Wait, I, I, just one more point about Barack Obama. Do I have to say this? You're on fire. In that speech where Barack Obama talked about how we're working together, Republicans and Democrats, for a health care plan that will not be uh, single payer. Don't worry about that. We realize you have healthy skepticism toward government. Some Republican got up and called Barack Obama a liar while he was holding out the fig. What is it? The peace branch. The guy, the Republican, took that peace branch and whacked him over the head with it. So don't be like Barack Obama in 2009. Don't be like Rahm Emanuel in 2009 and 2010 and 11, 12 Take when he was mayor of <laughs> city of Chicago. Get off your duff and do something about it. David Ferris is right. Democrats got to start playing the game like Republicans or they're going to lose. We got a great show today, everybody. Leonard Goodman will be here. Uh, he is a civil liberties attorney. We have so much to talk about. Do a Jeffrey Epstein update. The last time on, we were talking about Jeffrey Epstein, uh, but also talk about the Horowitz Report. Um, I'm obsessed with that. That's a mini obsession of mine, D. Uh, and the war on drugs. Uh, Leonard Goodman has written a couple columns for the reader. In addition to being a civil rights attorney, uh, he writes some columns for the reader. And uh, impeachment, his thoughts on impeachment. He's a big fan of Assange. We can talk about a little Assange uh, and get his thoughts on that. So I'm looking forward to Leonard Goodman. And then speaking of civil liberties, Sergio Mims will be here. And yes, we talk about him. He's our movie man. I will be doing Sergio. A Sergio. We will be doing a best movies <laughs> of the, uh, what is this decade? The, the teens as a bonus. Uh, with Tens? The the tens or the teens? Teens, tens, teens. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, we'll be doing a best movie bonus with Sergio. Uh, but in addition, we'll be talking politics with him. 
and we'll get to the point. Speaking of civil liberties, Twitter just kicked Sergio off. Boom, you're gone. <laughs> so, hey, doesn't Sergio get First Amendment uh, free expression rights? Donald Trump gets to go on Twitter, but Sergio can't. Well, hopefully it didn't go two for two and we kick him off this show. He gets all crazy, you know what I mean? No, we're, come on. You, you got to do a lot to get kicked off this show. <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, looking forward to talking movies, politics, Twitter, all good things uh, with Sergio Mendes. But before we do any of that, young man from Alton, Pride and joy. Oh, yeah, the 618. Back home, they call him the doctor with the news. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm Dennis. Christmas is over. Bring it, New Year. Before we, uh, <laughs> what? I just love when you go, oh, this is Dennis. I know. <laughs> yeah, he always cracks All right, up. the YouTube live stream chat is weighing in here. Uh, we got a new person weighing in. Oh. Big Dog. Oh, big That's, Dog. Yeah. <laughs> big Dog. D-O-G-G. D-O-double G. Okay. All right. And he just puts, what's this about? <laughs> I mean, Welcome to the show, big <laughs> dog. <laughs> I put on there mostly Chicago and uh, Illinois politics and been ranting like a weirdo. But... No, come on, big dog. You got to agree with me. Obama lay over, rolled over. All right, lay big down, dog. man. You know, and this, let me just say this. It'd be like saying, you know, uh, you're going to be like, if, if the Bears had this attitude, they'd be seven and eight and out of the playoffs. Oh, wait, the Bears are seven and eight out of the playoffs. Forget that analogy. I mean, they just, that's the problem, big dog. Okay, Democrats rolling over, letting Republicans get away with anything. So that's what we're talking about today, Big Dog. Yeah. Big Dog's going to get up there and knock on doors in Wisconsin. Don't right. roll over, Big Dog. <laughs> big Dog, don't roll over. You, know, you don't want a Big Dog rolling over. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, actually, we've been celebrating the new year here on the Ben Jarofsky Show in our own way. Right. Admittedly, it's pretty nerdy. With over 250 brand oh, yeah. new laws coming to the state of Illinois, our friends at WTTW Chicago recently highlighted 20 of them that you should know about, and then they posted it on their website. And ever since, we've been reading them one by one. Mm -hmm. Before we find out what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon, let's read another law right now. Thanks, WTTW Chicago. It's time for the 20 new laws of 2020. That's correct. All right. Jingle bells. This That's sounds like the, the music in One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest. Oh, really? Yeah. A, mo a movie I <laughs> Every millennial. Huh? What? Focus, anyway, Ben. Focus. Sorry, this man. new law coming in literally one week mm -hmm. is all about safeguarding genetic information. Last year, more than 12 million people had their DNA analyzed with direct-to-consumer genetic genealogy tests like Ancestry.com and 23andMe, Inc. As genetic testing becomes more popular, it is essential that personal information remain private, said Senator Jennifer Bertino Tarrant, the chief Senate sponsor of HB 2189. The new law prohibits companies from sharing any test results with health or life insurance companies without the consumer's written consent. Here, here, I like this law. I, I, I have mixed feelings about all this anyway. I have not participated in this, D. People voluntarily, uh, you know, swabbing the insides of their mouth and sending it off to some country. You don't know what they're doing with that DNA sample. And, uh, but everybody's obsessed with, you know, finding about what their genealogy is. And then, I don't know, there's part of me, D, that think the whole thing's a scam. So you, you do that, you send it in, and then they come back, oh, it turns out you're Scottish. And people are like, whoa, I'm Scottish. I didn't know that. <laughs> How do you know anyway? I mean, you just, that ain't charge you like, it's not cheap. All right, I mean, about $75. So I don't know what it costs. So I, I, the whole thing smells like a scam to me from start to finish. People voluntarily doing, but let's say it is legit. Let's say they actually do do a test of your DNA. Guess what? You think they're just going to sit with it? It's sort of like folks, if I can go on this tangent here, D. Uh, it's your uh, show. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite obsessions of, what did you call them? Gripes? Is that what you call them? Yeah. Gripes of well, went after 2018, and then it went over to 2019. Uh, Amazon deal. So every city in the country is bidding to win Amazon the right to get the second headquarters for Amazon to choose them to as a location for their second headquarters. Send the Am Amazon saying, basically, send us your DNA, say everything, your population, educational trends, property. Uh, give us all your prop uh, information, like your most valuable property sites that we can look at. Just Every conceivable piece of information uh, that the city can have, they just voluntarily turned it over to Amazon in the hopes that Amazon would choose them uh, to as the site where they locate their uh, headquarters and then pay, uh, the cities would then pay and the states would pay Amazon for that right. It was such a sucker's 
game, folks. You gave all this valuable insight and information over to Amazon. But you, you think they're just going to ignore that information? They're probably using it right now to figure out some ways to sucker you into buying stuff you don't even need. Or who knows what they're using it for? And it's very similar with the DNA. Oh, I think I'll just you know, swab it, give it to you. But who am I to say anything, D? I did the same thing with Facebook back in 2010. My oldest daughter said, you got to go on Facebook, Dad. So, you know, my name, my birthday, where I work, put that all. In. But by the way, have you heard, I know we're at a tangent with a tangent. Have, have well, you heard the Ben Jarofsky show? Have you heard the theory? Oh, God, this, when I say this, people are going to Ben, that's so old. The theory that Facebook is listening to you, your conversations, oh and my so God, that. That's so old. <laughs> have you heard this theory? Yeah. Have, okay, so I've been testing this theory. All right, I've heard this, this is plenty of discussion. My wife was telling me that she was talking about something or other, and then next thing you know, she had an advertisement pop up on her Facebook feed. Well, first of all, a couple things. I'm really bad at Facebook, so I don't know. Like, what's my feed? I got issues with that right there. So anyway, so I said I do a test. So for like five minutes, I just talked about the first thing that popped in my mind, Converse All-Stars. I love Converse All-Stars. I said, I love Converse All-Stars. Back in the day, I had Converse All-Stars. I had white Converse All-Stars, but sometimes I had black Converse All-Stars. I had high- so What were the results of that test? Nothing. <laughs> okay. It, you know what the results were? More once upon a time in Hollywood videos. I, Facebook has decided the only thing I care about is once upon a time in Hollywood. Oh, and uncut gems. Uh, I swear to God, D, 10 minutes doesn't pass without Facebook putting a uh, video advertisement for uncut gems, which I'm dying to see, by the way. I haven't seen it yet. So I'm starting to think maybe that's not true, that old theory that the more you, Facebook is listening to you. Either that or they don't know what a Converse All-Star is. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, DNA. Yeah, uh-huh. So protect people. Keep those companies from sending the information over to health insurances or life insurance. Try to get life insurance. They go, uh-uh, our study of your DNA information says you're going to die tomorrow. We're not giving you life insurance. So anyway, good, 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 good for you, state senate and state reps, for passing that bill. Six down. 14 more to go. It's the Ben Jarofsky shows, but actually WTTW Chicago's. <laughs> We're just reading it. 20 new laws of 2020. That's correct. <laughs> Robert Mueller. All right, now to the local news. Another damn dirty corruption update in Illinois. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. even during the season of holiday cheer, the most wonderful time of the year. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Following comes from the Chicago Sun Times and one Mitchell Armentrout. Yeah. Bitten, remember last week while we were doing the show and I had the breaking news that the Illinois Gaming Board moved to revoke the video gaming license of video gambling big wig and the owner of Gold Rush Gaming Company, Rick Heidner. Remember that? I do remember that. Yeah. Then you were like, oh, man, D, why'd they do that? <laughs> then I said it was because he allegedly offered up to $5 million in an illegal inducement to the owner of a gambling parlor chain that planned to remove Heidner's machine. And then you said something irrelevant about the Chicago Bulls. And I said no sports. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, I kind of remember that. Well, it sounds like a conversation we could have had any day. Well, this Mitchell Armand Trout from the Sun Times has more information on that. Please, no sports. So first <laughs> off, first off, we've now learned that according to uh, the disciplinary complaint against Heidner's Gold Rush Gaming Company, comes after his name surfaced in October in a federal search warrant for state senator Senator uh, Martin Sandoval's offices mm. as part of a broadening public corruption investigation. Ben, remind us all. Martin Sandoval. Who's that again? State Senator Martin Sandoval, southwest side, southwest suburb city of Chicago. Big powerhouse in the Democratic Party in that neck of the woods. He had to step down because turns out the feds were circling. We don't know exactly what they're looking for, but they're looking for something. Oh boy. We also now know that the alleged misdeed prompting the gaming board to try to strip Heidner's license happened more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. So... Here's how it went down. Cue the crime drama music. <laughs> According to the complaint filed December 17th by gaming board administrator Marcus Fruchter, Heidner went to Gibson Steakhouse in Rosemont on November 16th, 2018 to meet with the CEO of Laredo Hospitality Ventures, which owned 44 gaming establishments carrying Heidner's slot machines. The CEO told Heidner that Laredo was being bought by a new company owned by Daniel Fisher that planned to get rid of Heidner's slots, which would, quote, result in a significant loss of revenue for Heidner's company. Ten days later, Heidner met Fisher at a Norwich cafe and offered to, quote, arrange a purchase of Laredo for $5 million more than Fisher's company had paid for it. 
Fisher, who is the lead investor in the group, seeking... I'm not done yet. <laughs> just seeking, the music. Seeking, <laughs> seeking gaming board approval to open a new casino in Rockford, declined the offer. Days later, Heidner allegedly described his bid in a text message to Laredo's previous owner. Under state gambling law, giving anything of value to an establishment as an incentive or an inducement to locate video gambling terminals in that establishment is a felony. Heidner's proposed windfall payment was intended to keep his slots in Laredo establishments, making it an illegal inducement, the complaint says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time I uh, hear this story, and by the way, you read all the significant parts of the story. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I we talked about this last week. I think there was a story in the Tribune about this as well. Every time I hear this story, I have a confession to make, folks. I don't think about the wheeling and dealing behind the scenes of these gambling operators. Oh, no, negatory. You know what I think about? How hungry I am. They're oh. at Gibson's. I want some of that steak. They always talk about how they were at Gibson's and they were eating steak at Gibson. Mm, so good. And then the other one, this time it was just a Norwich cafe. I think when the Tribune did the story, they said it was, they specified it was a pancake house. Man, all day I was hoping for a pancake cakes and omelets after that remember the good good days d when we our host is a pig ladies and gentlemen <laughs> what was that place i used to love going to ellie's oh i love it this oh man the pancakes and the omelet anyway uh Ch chicago politics gambling politics a uh, big surprise here state of illinois wheeling and dealing behind the scenes you know powerful magnets giving campaign contributions to uh state senators state reps who do their bidding yep it's an old story in the city of chicago the state of illinois and uh uh, the Sun Times, yeah, here on Christmas, the day after Christmas, is exposing it. We'll see where it goes with this. Again, I have, I've said this many times. I have a lot of uh, issues with expanding gambling and trying to, and depending on gambling and gaming uh, to pay our bills. It's a, a, a dirty way to do it, folks. It's, it, it's, it's an addiction. Yesterday's Tribune. I don't know if you saw this, D, or was it the day before with the the reefer law, reefer being legalized. They had this headline: uh, "Pot." You know, it was one of those things. You know, the dangers of pot smoking. I, I think they called it pot. You know, they didn't call it reefer. They called it pot. Yeah, you know? You're the only one that calls it. Pot. I know, I'm the only one. There's a couple other people from the '70s who call it reefer. I'm not the only one. Anyway, uh, but the, you know, the dangers of pot. Is it? It was a tip. You know, it was a cautionary story, and there are some dangers like people who just take the edibles it's like oh i'll take a huge chunk of edible and they start freaking out and then they always have the line in there leave about, me alone <laughs> marijuana then they're always like appealing to baby boomers like people like myself you know uh who, who smoked lots of reefer back in the 70s they're like it's different now it's 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 this this reefer is tough well this pot is a lot stronger than the stuff you did in the 70s is that true d what that the weed now stronger? Yeah, well, oh, I know yeah. you weren't around in the seventies. Oh but... no, my mom called me because uh, she stopped doing it, and then she started up again. Yeah, you're just threw mom. your mom under the bus yeah. there. Oh, D. <laughs> uh, no, she called me. She's like, "Oh man, D, you know what? My mom calls me D, by the way, too, like Ben does. Uh, D, I tell you, this marijuana is a lot stronger now than yeah. it was then." And I'm like giving her tips on how to like not. So how do I? It just stinks so bad. Uh, like, oh. put it in a mason jar, mom. Lock it up there. What? Wait, what does that do? But oh, it, it tightens the, it up, keeps the smell, you know. Marijuana tips from the doctor. Uh, <laughs> hey. And his mom calls him deep, but she's also been known to call him a white lightning. No, from okay, no. <laughs> but anyway, so there was the warning that, you know, the, the typical warning that they give to boomers, this stuff is stronger. So, like, boomers are going to run out and eat a huge edible. I know this happened because there's a certain someone I know who will remain anonymous who's known for making edibles. Remember this story, D? Yeah. And he gave me that edible, and like a fool, I ate it. Whoa. Ah, uh, reefer's not for me. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to partake uh, with the when Still it trying later. to talk him into doing that uh, Benny J bonus interview where we take, where Ben takes an edible <laughs> and then he interviews somebody. Oh, my God. That'd and be I, awesome. I have many friends who are, come on, Benny, man. Come on, smoke some reefer with me, man. Blah, blah. Uh-uh, it's just not my thing. But uh, anyway, so uh, the warnings, uh, the Tribune has the warning about reefer, but they never have warnings about gambling. Somehow or other, the mainstream media in this town is like, well, gambling, <laughs> that's acceptable. But Reefer's like, ooh, ooh, scary. Whoa, Reefer. So uh, gambling's no joke, folks. And so we're trying, uh, this is what we're going to pay our bills with. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, a good idea, but whatever. I mean, that's where we're at. We don't want to raise taxes on rich people. So we're just going to raise taxes on everybody else through gambling. People chasing. By the way, Mrs. Maisel, have you been watching Mrs. Maisel? No. 
Mrs. Maisel TV show on uh, what is it on uh, Amazon Prime? Oh. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I'm really into it. Uh, so anyway, there's a scene where the, where uh, Mrs. Maisel goes to uh, Vegas for the first time and and starts playing the slots, and you can see the addiction. I know what she's talking about because first time I went to Vegas, man, I was playing those slots. <laughs> So it's no joke. Anyway, and so uh, yes, yeah, age-old story. An interesting thing, a little, a uh, little funny in the Armatrot story, which I read in the train coming down here. Uh, Heidner's spokesman, the gentleman Heidner, who's at the uh, center of this story, is a gentleman named Randall Sanborn. I've been around Chicago so long. I've never met Randall Sanborn, but I, I remember he was a spokesperson for the feds. Way back when in the day, used to call him up every now and then, ask him for comments about investigations the feds were. Never said any, uh, bad. we have nothing to comment on on that one. <laughs> I was not one of the favorite reporters that the feds would like no. leak stuff. I know. We're going to be talking about that with uh, Leonard Goodman. He's, of course, Blago's attorney, among other things. Speaking of, let's break the fourth wall here. Has he texted you at all? Is he here? Oh, uh, hold on. Let me look. Let's look here. Uh, you owe me. Oh, that's not for somebody. That's my gambling guy. Uh, uh, lay hold on. That's a different text. Uh, Ben, you got any good reefer? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, no, he's not texting me. Okay. All right. Anyway. So anyway, yeah. Uh, you could be, you could be sure of one thing when it comes to, uh, gambling, uh, in Chicago and Illinois. Uh, well, two things. One, it's a sucker's game and, uh, foolish people are chasing, uh, a big winning that they probably won't get will be funding government as opposed to wealthy people through a tax, uh, a progressive income tax. So the same people who are chasing uh, the fortunes only to lose will probably either not vote or vote for, oh God, I'm getting depressed already, of, uh, excuse me, either not vote or vote against uh, a fair tax. And so they'll just continue with this regressive uh, system so you can be sure of that and you can also be sure that the people the wheelers and dealers behind the scenes will be taking care of the state reps and the state senators uh who write the gambling laws it's an age-old story in the state of illinois all right finally before we move along here on the program let's learn about another new law coming to illinois in 2020 Ooh. it's the 20 new laws of 2020 all right, I'm not doing the sleigh bells for this don't one. Do, uh, uh, this one's serious all oh, right oh. sleigh bells Wait, what was in the other one serious it's like 23 and me. I don't know. I felt that was sleigh bell worthy. This one, a little more serious. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next new law is all about defining consent. Starting in the year 2020, sex education classes must include age appropriate discussions on the meaning of consent. The new law details what must be covered in those discussions, including that consent can be withdrawn at any time and that past consent does not cons uh, constitute future consent. Understanding consent is a critical part of the conversation on sexual assault prevention, said Representative Ann Williams, who introduced SB 3550 in a statement. We cannot wait until students go to college or into the workplace to have a discussion about what it means to consent to sexual interaction. Ann Williams, North Side uh, representative, Democrat, happens to be my state rep. How about that, D? Huh? Ann oh. Williams been a guest on the show a couple of times. Uh, here, here. I applaud that, uh, that bill. About time. Where are you going? Oh, he's at the door, right? This door? Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Is he? No. Oh, hey, Sergio's in here. Oh, Sergio. All right, Sergio coming. Sergio's here. I love it when my guests come early. Uh, anyway, uh, well, what Sergio here reminds me, this is a, a, a bit of a, uh, it's in the same ballpark. I saw Bombshell uh, yesterday. It was my Christmas Day movie. Excellent flick about Fox News. Uh, the perversion at Fox News, the intimidation at Fox News, uh, the way in which they look the other way all those years as uh, powerful people at Fox News uh, force women to have sex with them in exchange for promises that they would help their career. So uh, this stuff has been on my mind. And he, here, here, uh, Ann Williams, society is finally coming to terms um, with this, uh, with men preying on women, and it's about freaking time. All right, so there you are, the latest law there. All right, bring the sleigh bells back in now. All right, seven down, 13 more to go. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show's 20 new laws of 2020. But once again, it's actually WTTW Chicago. <laughs> they did all the work. We're just reading. <laughs> all right, Leonard Goodman is here. Oh. I'm going to go grab him. We're going to take a quick little break. And after that break, Ben, tell us what we're going to talk about with Leonard Goodman. Leonard Goodman, we're going to be talking about civil liberties. Uh, he's a civil liberties lawyer. He's Murad Bogoyevich's lawyer. I'll probably do an Epstein update, Jeffrey Epstein. Last time uh, Leonard was on the show, we talked a lot about Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, Horowitz report, the report that said the Justice Department... Uh, 
and the FBI kind of made a mess of the early stages of the investigation into uh, Donald John Trump and potential collusion with the Russians. Talk about that. Civil liberty. And he's a big Assange fan. Julian Assange will talk a little bit about that. So a lot of civil liberties news with Leonard Goodman. All right. Don't go anywhere. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show live from the Chicago Sun-Times. That's correct. Hey, everybody, what you're about to hear are the PMs of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind, but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm gonna spell it out for you people. J E F F. M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, U, E, L, P, I, A, N, I, S, T, dot com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel. Let's talk about uh, the debate tonight. You worked for Presidents Clinton and uh, President Obama. I'm mm -hmm. sure you did a lot of debate prep yeah. for those two guys. Um, who got close to their level tonight? Who impressed you well, on stage? You know, uh, 
President Obama had, yes, yes, we can. Yep. President Clinton had, uh, as you know, put people first. We have, damn it, I wrote the bill. So that's kind of the closest. Uh, you think Bernie last night no, had the no, best I moment don't, of the two I, nights? No, I think. Here's Endorsing I, Bernie, thank you no, very much. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that will not help Bernie right now, given his base. Uh, so here's what I think. I think Democrats love to fall in love. Mm -hmm. Republicans fall in line. Mm -hmm. And we're not yet in love. We're still dating. And that's the process right now. Okay. There's a lot more debates. Mm -hmm. And we're going to still date. How many, how many more dates before... Uh, a while. W really? You're not, nobody's, ready to come, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's ready to come home and see the in-laws yet. No one's going to... No. no jumping in the sack no, after not, tonight? No, no, no. No? Not, this is... No, we no, got a while. Not that? I, see, you and I, and everybody, we love this every inch. We're measuring every 25 yards, etc. This is a marathon. said that we were going to accomplish some things when we took on this contract fight. Um, almost. I, um, r right now, um, All right, everybody, commercial break over. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. With me, as promised, Leonard Goodman. Uh, welcome back to the show, Leonard. Hey, Ben. It's nice to see you. Uh, the last time Leonard was on, we did a, a deep dive into uh, all things Jeffrey Epstein, and uh, it was uh, a lot of people went for that show. It's uh, still getting hits. Uh, there's a lot of Jeffrey Epstein interest out there. Uh, so the first question I have for you before we go on to the other things we're going to talk about the Horowitz report and Julian Assange and the winners losers in the drug game uh is do you have any new theories on uh about Jeffrey Epstein you wrote an essay for the reader on the topic where you said uh you raised the fact that it was probably uh he was probably an operative for intelligence agencies and we can't overlook that connection that possible connection has anything broken that I may have missed since the last time you're on your show, I think we were, it was about a couple of months ago you were on the show. No, I mean, I would say what the news is, is that the story has disappeared, you know, predictably, that, uh, you know, nobody wants to dive into his intelligence connections. Nobody wants to embarrass the intelligence agencies. And, you know, it's, it's a shame. But, I mean, there was reports that an independent forensic analysis uh, was done and said that he probably didn't kill himself because of a, a broken bone. I'm not a doctor, but... Um, it says that it's very unlikely that this was a suicide. You know, there was a camera that wasn't functioning outside of his cell in, one, you know, in, the, in the MCC in Manhattan. So it's, it's quite suspicious. Uh, I think, you know, the, the news media is basically like nothing to see here, move <laughs> on. And, you know, that's a shame because, you know, as, you know, as we talked about last time, Acosta basically said, I was told to back off because he was with intelligence. So, Acosta being the district attorney in Florida way back when. The, uh, the U.S. attorney U.S. In attorney, excuse me, yeah, in Florida. Yeah. yeah, so that's what he said in private. In public, uh, he, he sang a different tune. So, All right. You know. Well, this is one of these stories, you're right, that's just sort of simmering there. I still get updates. I think I may have mentioned this to you last time in your show. I, I'm on the uh, Tea Party uh, email list. not quite sure why, but I am. So I get regular updates uh, on, on this. Every, every now and then I get an update on Epstein because apparently uh, the Tea Party right has concluded that this is beneficial to uh, their 
political persuasion because there's a Bill Clinton connection. There's also a Donald John Trump connection to Jeffrey Epstein, but that's not as uh, what palpable as the Bill Clinton connection. So for what it's worth, I don't get uh, lefties. Well, I actually don't get lefties sending that kind of stuff anyway, Leonard. So the way the left and the, the right fight, uh, it's like two separate entities do you get what i'm saying that- i do and you know that's that's a shame is that i i think a lot of you know mainstream media has become so partisan that you know they don't want to take on issues if it's going to you know blow back on their people so you know if it's going to blow back on bill clinton or their their friends in the intelligence community they don't want to touch it and the republicans don't want to touch it if it might blow back on trump um so so no one touches it, and then you know we don't get we don't get the story. And I think that you know the Epstein case is a really good, good illustration of that problem. And that's why it's good that we have you know independent uh, reporters in in papers like the Reader and you know some of the others that will actually dive into the truth yeah. and, and try know. to find uh, what's going on. Well, speaking of which, uh, there's a connection here. Uh, one of the essays you wrote for the reader uh, struck a chord with me because I've been talking about this on the show a lot or had been talking about a bit anyway, and that is uh, impeachment, why you're not excited about impeachment. I happen to be very enthusiastic about impeachment uh, f- for reasons of, uh, similar to why I'm excited about the Horowitz Report. I may be the only person in the world who's excited by the Horowitz Report and impeachment because it's bringing to light stuff that would be otherwise buried. Uh, if there weren't a special interest, and in this case a Republican or a Democrat, that would benefit from having that stuff come out. But one thing you said in the uh, in the report that re- uh, resonated with me is, uh, in your essay about impeachment, is that, follow me on this, the Democrats held back on impeaching uh, George W. Bush back in 2004, I want to say, or 2003, even though there was evidence uh, that he and his administration lied about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and ginned up support for a war that right. was necessary. Talk about that. Right. Well, Nancy Pelosi said it was off the table. Um, and, you know, there, there was overwhelming evidence that they lied. It wasn't a mistake. I mean, they basically told us that it, there was conclusive proof um, that Saddam was, uh, was a instantane, you know, was a existential threat to the United States, that he, you know, had newly constituted his his uh, nuclear weapons program, and he was sitting on these stockpiles of sarin gas, and um, it was all bullshit. And, you know, it was based on reports that the intelligence community had discredited from an informant named Curveball and from someone else that they tortured um, in, to get him to say that, that uh, there was a ke- chemical weapons program. And on a an invoice that was clearly forged. They knew it was forged about Saddam buying uranium from Niger. You probably remember that whole Mm -hmm. story. Um, So they knew it was false. They continued to say it. Uh, The news media repeated it without demanding any proof because, of course, they tell us it's all classified. We We can't show you the evidence. You just have to go along. And, you know, it's... So I, I think that's really my main problem with impeachment is if it's off the table for something like a war that, that killed hundreds of thousands of people, cost us trillions of dollars, money that we could use for a Green New Deal, um, you know, health care, national or true national health care system. Um, if it's off the table for that, but, it's, but we're going to fight about a, a phone call Trump had, which was clearly improper, um, you know, with the president of Ukraine, it's just, to me, the Democrats lose any credibility. Um, you know, and, and the other thing, I think this goes back to a, a conversation you were having with uh, Professor Ferris the other day. You know, you were talking about the NDAA. You know, I mean, what sense does it make? I mean, if, if the Democrats are saying that Trump is a clear and present danger, um, he's a national security risk. He must be. We have to go forward with this impeachment. And yet they approve $750 <laughs> billion dollars yeah. so that he can make war anywhere in the world, including in space. I mean, what's, I think it just shows you, you know, that, that you know, the, the so-called opposition party is a sham. And well, let's get into this. Uh, it, it's off the table. Uh, the, the, uh, I started the show, you were probably in route, Leonard, so you didn't hear it, uh, railing about about Obama's early uh, days in the White House uh, and uh, 
uh, and how he botched health care, in my humble opinion, uh, by being too nice with the Republicans, uh, chasing the illusion that there's bipartisanship when there's no evidence whatsoever at all. Okay. I, I would push back a little bit on that he was being too nice. Uh, okay. But I, I would say that he was, he was, it, he took, he took a lot of money from health insurance companies, from big pharma. You know, I think it, it's the same, we could talk about Buttigieg too. You know, it's the exact same thing. It's, you know, it's not just bad strategy. It's people that are, you know, bought and paid for by these interests. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I bought into Obama too. I was probably with you in Grant Park. I was not in Grant Park, okay. but went for the <laughs> Celebrating. record. Celebrating, <laughs> yeah. and you know, the. The bloom faded quickly for me. You know, I represented a Guantanamo detainee. He promised to close Guantanamo. He went and bailed out the banks um, after saying he was going to get tough on Wall Street. He, and, you know, instead of being an anti-war president, which is what I somehow believed, um, and uh, he expanded the wars, yeah. you know, put more troops in Well, there's in a reason you believe that, and I'll, I'll, I'll trace back. We're going back into Obama, to, but I want to go back to Bush eventually, so don't let me forget All that right. train of thought. But I believe... That in the most general way, uh, Barack Obama was victorious in 2008 because he participated in one, count them one, anti-war protest in the city of Chicago in 2002. I, and I believe he was he was a lowly state senator and he showed up and that gave him credibility as an anti-war candidate in Iowa. And fast forward to 2008 caucus and he was victorious i remember that very careful close i remember that uh, uh leonard because it, he was able to distinguish himself from hillary clinton joe biden was in the race as well uh in that election he he didn't vote against or for because he wasn't in congress at the time but he participated in that one demonstration he's probably the greatest thing he ever did uh and so that's why people like you people in iowa said oh he's anti-war so right. that's probably why. You know, a lot of people smarter than me said, you know, don't buy it. Look at the money. Look at his donors. Even back then, you know, he's taking money from the defense industry. He's taking money from Wall Street. Don't buy this hope and change rhetoric. Uh, you know, I got sucked in and, you know, I think a lot of people did. But he certainly was not anti-war. I mean, you know, the defense budgets kept growing under mm -hmm. Obama. He, you know, escalated the drone program. We, we, you know, have military bases all throughout Africa. Um, because of Obama, and um, so yes, uh, I think um, you know. I I think the most important thing, and this is I think something missing from a lot of mainstream uh, pundits when they talk about politics, is they you know they talk about the strategy and Democrats don't want to appear weak, but they don't like to talk about the money, you know. And I think Buttigieg, because I know you you guys were talking about this too, and um, it's been on my mind. Um, you know, he's such a great example because this is a guy, you know, this, you know, a gay, gay a mayor of, a, you know, of Indiana town and, you know, this big liberal. And he makes a pledge that he's for Medicare for all. He actually made a pledge, I think, on his website. Um, and then he starts taking all this corporate money. And, you know, he, in, in the last debate, he got called out for it. And he said, well, we can't have purity tests. But. You know, he takes all this corporate money and now he's spouting uh, industry talking points that, you know, that Bernie Sanders, his Medicare for all, he wants to throw you off your health care system. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're a privileged person like myself and you have good health care, the system seems to work OK. But, you know, for a lot of people, this is a huge issue. You know, they can't afford to get sick, even if they have insurance off of Obamacare. They can't afford the deductibles. They can't afford um to get sick, they can't afford the the premiums that they have to pay, and you know, it, I think it's the leading cause of bankruptcy is medical debt. Um, you know, this is after Obamacare, right. so I would agree with you where you started on this whole thing. You know that that was a huge disappointment, and if you remember when Obama, this was his you know signature achievement. Yeah. you'll remember that he had both houses of Congress, yes. I believe. No. You know. I, this is a mini obsession of mine, uh, Leonard, comparing the way Donald Trump, I say this all the time on the show, has claimed a mandate that he didn't actually get in the election and has ruled as though he had overwhelming support. Doesn't care. Say, George W. Bush did the same thing in 2001. They claim a mandate that they didn't get from the voters. Uh, and 
in contrast, Obama acts as though he didn't get a mandate. Obama, who got a resounding mandate, had, had Democratic-controlled Congress and Senate, acted as though, you know, he barely eked out a victory, and he was looking, I'm going to work, this is what I'm saying, he was nice, but you're probably right, it wasn't nice, it was, it was an unseen influence, but I want to work with the Republicans. So uh, off automatically, off the table, is health care for all automatically gone? That we're not they even going to consider. even allowed that. in the room. If you remember that big round, that big conference room table with all the debate, you know, the televised discussion about they did, wouldn't even let anyone that supported a true national uh, health care system in the room. Yeah, it might contaminate them. Yeah. All right. So now let's go back. I said I didn't want to lose the train of thought. You said it's uh, impeachment in two thousand uh, and three or four, whenever that would have been. Uh, was off the table. You you made this point uh, briefly uh, just about five minutes ago in this discussion, but you also made it in your reader essay. Why do you say it's off the table? Well, that's what that's that was Nancy Pelosi's uh, my, my question should be, why, in your opinion, did they take it off the table? Well, because the donors didn't want a debate about uh, lies going to, to take us to war. I mean, the donors to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party um, both want presidents to be free to lie us into war because they need uh, enough conflict zones going in the world to justify $750 billion defense budgets. And, you know, I think, you know, in some ways the Democrats are worse because at least the Republicans are somewhat honest about it. I mean, Trump will come out and say the reason why we're helping the Saudi Arabia kill children in Yemen it's because of the contracts. You know, they're buying all these weapons from, you know, General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Um, and we can't, uh, you know, I, I can't sacrifice those, those contracts. The Democrats pretend uh, that they're fighting for the working people, and yet somehow they always manage uh, to do the business of the donors and to make sure, you know, look at this, you know, this NDAA. I mean, what was it? Like some 50 Democrats voted against it just enough so that they can say, you know, some of them have a conscience. And, you know, our great congressperson, Jan Schakowsky, was one of them. And mm -hmm. uh, I love Jan. Um, but, you know, the game is rigged. And they always, it, they always make sure that the donors uh, get what they need. Um, and, then, and then they come out and pretend that they're fighting for the working people and they're really not a war party. But the Democrats are clearly a war party. All right. Now, when you say these kinds of things, what do your friends of the Democratic persuasion say? I know you must have some mainstream Democratic friends. Either I don't have any friends left. <laughs> I'm going to tell you because yeah. you know it's it actually has been rough. I think the Trump election was really hard. I mean, and I. I mean, what do you mean by that? The well, Trump election. Well, you know, I, there's so many people that I love, and you know, I really respect their opinion, and we basically agree, you know, in terms of our goals or where we want this country to go. But you know, people that sit and watch MSNBC. Um, and I, you know, I tell people this is not news that you're watching. This is gossip. And, you know, I think we got an you know, example of that with the Horowitz report. <laughs> We're kind of all over the place We're going to get to but, the Horowitz report. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, it's just it's a huge embarrassment to what we've been told for the last two years about Russia. You know, Trump is a Russian agent. Um, and yet we're going to give him $750 billion so he can make war anywhere he wants without any congressional action. In fact, they took out, um, you know, they were supposed to, uh, there was something that the Democrats had, had put in in committee about, well, if he wants to go to war against Iran, he has to come to Congress. They took that out. So he can do whatever the hell he wants. He can start a war in space. Um, and this guy is so dangerous that we have to remove him. I mean, I think that really tells you what you need to know about the state of our national politics it's really it's it's a disgrace in so, my view so when you uh express opinions like this uh to your f democratic friends what do they say to you uh they get angry and you know i've i've had a lot of people that i just can't sit down and talk with anymore because um you know i had a very dear friend we were having lunch um and when i said that i this was during the the right right before the election, and I said I could not vote for Hillary Clinton. I was going to vote third party. And now I'm consistent. I didn't vote for Barack Obama in 2012 either. I voted third party. Um, 
whoever that was. I think I voted for the Justice Party. Or okay, something. I was saying <laughs> Jill Stein. Did you? Vote it wasn't for it? Jill. St- I I did vote for Jill Stein this time, but okay. in 2012, I, I don't remember. I think I voted for the the mayor of uh, Salt Lake City that was running. Oh, was I re- Justice uh, Democrat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember his name, but I remember what was his name? Rocky. I'm Rocky. Say, Rocky. Yes. Wow. Was Rocky. Where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she got up and left the table. You know, could could not. Uh, you know, you have to vote against Trump. And now I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of Trump, but I, you know. <laughs> Whenever anybody is, starts a sentence, I'm not a fan of is, Trump, but, uh-oh, where are know, we going with this? Ralph Nader said something in, in yeah. uh, the 2000, when he was running in 2000. And, mm-hmm. but, was it 2000? Yeah, against, uh, in the, with Gore and, uh, and Bush. And he said, you know, if you think I'm the best candidate, he was talking to a bunch of young people. He said, if, you're, if you think I'm the best candidate, you should vote for me. Don't let them scare you. Um, into saying you have to compromise, you have to vote for the lesser of two evils, you mm-hmm. know, because once you start compromising, that's going to become a habit in your life. And, you know, that struck a chord with me. Now, it's a shame that, you know, we have a system where it's winner take all. I mean, there's ways that you could re- reform it with, you know, ranked choice voting or something so that you could vote for the person you really want um, and have a second choice um, and, and not, it, but, you know, the Democrats don't want that. Because they want, the, they want it to be winner take all so that they can scare you every election and say, look, we sold you out to Wall Street. We sold you out to Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. But you have to vote for us because look how scary this person is over there. And you can't give that person four more years. And, you know, I, I think if we keep falling for that, we're never going to get really what we need, you know, to save the planet. I mean, you, sir, you, you cannot spend $750 billion on war um, and have money left over for a Green New Deal or for health care or for mm-hmm. college uh, for people. It's just the, the numbers do not add up. So when you hear uh, Bernie Sanders and his campaign, are you encouraged by that? Yeah, I'm encouraged by the fact that, that it seems like people are waking up and they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not buying these... Uh, these candidates that are taking all this Wall Street money. I think they're starting to say, wait a second, why should I trust you? Um, and I think Bernie Sanders is one of the few that has this ring of authenticity. He's been saying the same thing. He's not holding big money uh, fundraisers. Uh, he's not taking money from Wall Street or from the defense industry. Um, he's raising money from uh, you know small donors. And you know, I think that is encouraging, and he's showing that it can be done. Because- well, you're a key swing vote, so I'm going to use you as a, a typical swing voter. We have this conversation on the show all the time, Leonard. We go from, like, we go from discussions uh, of principle of sorts, like what should we tolerate as a, uh, as a country? So, is what Donald Trump's behavior with Ukraine acceptable? Uh, and then we have those discussions, and then we have like the pragmatic, practical, deep dives. Like, should the Democrats nominate a centrist like Joe Biden, or uh, should they go with their convictions and nominate a Bernie or uh, Elizabeth Warren? And it's always viewed. Follow me on this one. Like, there are swing voters. This is just a story on the front page of the New York Times uh, today on this very topic. I read in the train coming in. Picking Biden as a bait to lure centrist voters. And it talks about Democratic voters in Iowa who are lefty, are more of the lefty persuasion, but they're going to vote for Biden. Follow me on this because they have friends who are swing voters and they think if Biden's a nominee, those swing voters, those Republican swing voters uh, will go to Biden. But they never think about uh, the Leonard Goodmans of the world, and I know a ton of them. <laughs> they voted Green Party uh, in 2016 with a Bernie Sanders candidacy get these swing voters to vote democrat so would you would it be enough for you yes i would i would i would vote for bernie i think i could probably live with elizabeth warren um you know i i I saw that article in new york times too i you know i wonder but some of those that are sort of more anecdotal i i wonder because you know i I don't know those people um, that are true lefties, that really believe in a national health care system, that really believe that kids should be able to go to college without being in debt for the rest of their lives, mm-hmm. um, that really believe that we need to clean up this planet, um, that are going to vote for a Biden or, you know, 
or Buttigieg, Buttigieg or yeah. somebody that's clearly on the payroll of these organizations. And, you know, this is something that I also find encouraging that some of these candidates are, you know, Biden is having trouble raising money. I, I find that to be encouraging because, you know, why would you send $20 if you actually care about national health care, a true Medicare for all system, so we don't go bankrupt when we get sick? If you really care about that, why would you send $20 to a candidate that's on the payroll of big pharma and health insurance? Um, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I think people are, are starting to get smarter yeah. and say, you know, I'm not falling for this anymore. Well, I hope you're right about that. I'm always a little uh, uh, cautious about saying voters are getting smarter because I spent so much time covering Chicago politics. Uh, but maybe you're correct. And I have to say, before we move on to the subject, reading these books, and I've been doing this deep dive in the early years of Obama. I don't know, maybe I'm a masochist. Probably for an article I'm going to write for the reader. Uh, but uh, contrasting Obama to Trump, but reading these articles and listening to that, revisiting the arguments that were raised in 2009, Leonard, from uh, mainstream Democrats, it just bring it. They're just the same things I'm hearing in the debate. The stuff that Joe Biden says about health care, that uh, Amy Klobuchar says about health care, uh, that th there's some of the others who've left the stage. Tim Ryan, I don't remember him, he was a congressman from Ohio. He was on the stage for a while about you know, defending uh, the rights of union people. They try to blame it on the union. Right. <laughs> they negotiated a, a, this one kills me right here, Leonard. I'm going to tangent with a tangent, but in the same book that I'm reading about Obama 2009, they're bemoaning the fact that healthcare costs are quote baked into the cost of every car that, uh, Detroit produces. Okay, this is when they were bailing out Detroit, and they go, "How could you have a system where you baked into the cost healthcare?" And so they forced the union, uh, it's part of that deal, to save their jobs to pay a greater share of their healthcare costs. Here we are, eight years later, and you got Tim Ryan's of the world telling, "I'm standing up for the unions and the, the their hard fought, negotiated." gains in health care. I'm like, you just, you'll snatch those health care gains away at the drop of a hat. Sure. So it's a sucker's game, Leonard Goodman. Yes, yes it is. Um, anyway, all right. That said, I, I'm i I'm wholeheartedly for impeachment. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trot this theory out for the first time ever. Let's see how, if it totally bombs. I think impeachment is our first step toward a parliamentary system of government here in this country. We're it's like a vote of no confidence. Essentially, we we had a uh, the the popular the one who won the the popular vote did not get to take the White House. So we have the a candidate who lost the election is the president, and as I say, claimed a mandate. That's a contradiction in itself, right there. You talk about going against the popular will. The mo the people voted for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, you know, but the, again, it maybe it comes back. To, it, it, it sort of reminds me about Blagojevich. You know, the guy's an asshole, so it's like we can we can do whatever we need to do to to lock him up. Um, you know, yes, Trump uh, did not win the, but but still, he, uh, according to the rules of our electoral college, and you know, he is the, he is the president. So um, I would have a, I would support a censure based on this uh, this phone call, which is clearly improper, um, but. I think impeachment, it, it, you know, I think, I guess the other way that I look at it is, you know, with both parties that are on the payroll of the same interests, okay, <laughs> yeah. there is only a very limited sphere where we can argue, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is something that, you know, the corporate masters um, of both parties allow us to argue about. They First of all, they don't trust Trump. They never did. Um, and, you know... But this is something that they. This is a distraction. This impeachment. Um, they would. The Raytheon and uh, J.P. Morgan and the health insurance companies are perfectly happy to have us spend six months mm -hmm. arguing about impeachment. First of all, and the other problem is, I might agree with you if we didn't already know how it's going to come out. And this is where I, I put in my. And I, yeah. you know, I'd like to give a plug to my my reader article. And you know, after you read Ben's columns, you should read my columns. <laughs> the little but, difference of agreement, <laughs> opinion there. But it is. Um, you know, this was right when they announced impeachment. And I said, yeah, everyone knows how it's going to come yeah, out. It's true. You know, they're going to impeach him in, in, in the House and he's going to be acquitted in the Senate. So why are we going through this exercise? Um, well, and, I'll, I will answer that question with uh, bringing up the Horowitz report. All right. uh, I've spent my whole life 
trying to figure out what Chicago government was about. And I paused, start the, I've been, lately I've been apologizing for being so focused on Chicago and I <laughs> missed Obama's year, early years and what was going on because I was so focused. Like at that time, it was uh, the Olympics, Mayor Daley's insane plan to bankrupt the city by bringing the Olympics here, which was completely support. You talk about bipartisan support, Leonard. Absolutely everybody in the city of Chicago, with the exception of the Chicago Reader, was waving the flag for the Olympics. Not everybody. There was a handful of malcontents who, uh, who joined me uh, in opposition. So uh, I, 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 I'm well aware of the fact uh, that government is always trying to conceal what they're up to. There's just this, and so I welcome any attempt to peel away the layers that cover up what's going on. So that is twofold. One, I mean, go back to the Iraqi war, the lies that were told uh, to convince us that that war was worth fighting. Definitely, I wish we had an impeachment hearing to get people to speak uh, under oath about what was true and what wasn't. What did Colin Powell know when he gave that speech at the United Nations? rallying us to war i would have loved to have had that in in the case of donald john trump the impeachment hearings what was he trying to do with ukraine uh what was uh giuliani's role in all that so get that and then similarly horowitz report which came out it was the department of justice inspector general did a report about the early stages of the russian investigation what motivated the fbi to seek a federal wiretap uh of donald trump uh, and some of his cohorts and coll or allies and supporters. Uh, what motivated? And I, I welcome that from the, the same reason I would welcome an investigation into the Iraqi war. Let's shed some light on what government's up to. You agree with that point at least? I do. Absolutely. I agree. We should, you know, there's too much secrecy. And, um, you know, it's dangerous because if the government has complete control over the information that gets out, you know, they leak classified information all the time that, that tells the, the narrative that, that they want, that those in power want. But, you know, if they can completely control the information that gets out, um, then they can lie with impunity. And we really have no recourse. And, you know, I think that's, you know, the my recent column about Assange and Manning, that's what, you know, basically the point that I was making is why it's so important that we have whistleblowers and that we have outlets where whistleblowers can, uh, can have their material published um, because it's the only chance we have of knowing what our government is up to because they're not going to tell us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, going back to what, what motivated them to go after Trump, you know, the, the Horowitz report is interesting. I, th I think the, the most surprising thing and i guess i kind of knew this but i had forgotten and that is that you know you, you remember the whole church committee and all the abuses the 70s, of yeah. the fbi where you know they were investigating civil rights groups and martin mm -hmm. luther king and you know black panthers and you know fred hampton was killed and and these black bag jobs and you know all these things and so there was these reforms the church committee all these reforms in the 70s um that came out of the church committee and they were all basically um disposed of after 9-11. Um, and that was under Mueller at the FBI and Ashcroft at uh, Attorney General. Um, they basically just did away with all of those protections and said, you no longer need any, any evidentiary predicate to launch an investigation. All you need is basically a rumor. I heard that Carter Page was working with, you know, who's, who's on Trump's team, uh, is working with the Russians. And that's all they need. Um, and I think you know, no one in Congress said a word about this at the time because I think everyone just thought, oh, it's going to be used against Muslims and terrorists. Um, well, it wasn't just used against Muslims, and it was used against, you know, the Trump campaign and his people. So I think, you know, we're starting to see that, you know, when you, when you let fear and, and you allow the, these, these intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies to have basically unlimited power, mm -hmm. um, and it bit us once back in the 70s, and we tried to stop it, and, and it's happening again. Um, well, the, and so the Horowitz report uh, documents some, they, you know, it, they didn't go uh, far enough to satisfy Donald Trump or William Barr, so I, apparently they're ordering a second investigation. Uh, that's how Republicans go. The big difference between Republicans and Democrats, they don't get that first, that first buddy of the apple doesn't work out for the Republicans, let's get another, it's like Benghazi. How many times do they try to kill Obamacare as, as wimpy as it was, Obamacare, they try to kill it. Uh, they didn't want Obama to get credit for anything. Uh, in fact, they're trying to kill it right now in the courts of uh, Texas. But uh, 
Uh, and so there's going to be a second investigation. But they found that there was evidence that, uh, that some FBI agents what were sloppy. Uh, well, they, they yeah. misled the FISA court. Um, it wasn't just sloppiness. I mean, they um, they changed documents. Uh, they altered documents. Um, they misled the court. They cherry-picked information uh, to make it look like uh, Carter Page was, um, you know, a, a Russian agent. And um, the, the other thing that's significant is they, and this is what we were told on MSNBC and CNN for two years, uh, we were told just the opposite, that the Steele dossier, which was basically, you know, paid political operative, it was, it's gossip, it's untested gossip, mm -hmm. um, purchased by the Democratic Party in the, the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, that this had nothing to do with the warrants on Carter Page. Well, of course, it, according to Horowitz, it was the central um, evidence mm -hmm. that supported uh, the warrants for the, the wiretaps. Mm -hmm. And they knew that this information was unreliable. And then as the time went on and they kept renewing the application for this intense surveillance of uh, four people, including Carter Page, um, they learned that, in fact, the information was untrue. Mm -hmm. They went and, because it was all, you know, Steele didn't do any reporting himself. He didn't have any direct information. He was just reporting what people told him. Well, they went to his subsource, and the subsource said, I never told him that. Um, he's exaggerating. He's embellishing. So they knew that. They didn't tell the FISA court. They kept renewing these warrants. Um, they didn't tell the FISA court that Carter Page was, in fact, um, an agent with the CIA um, because they wanted to make him look like a Russian agent. Well, in fact, he was working with the CIA and were giving information about Russia. Um, so... This is, this is really quite um, a scandal, and what he uncovered, and hopefully it will lead to some reforms. Maybe we can go back um, to the church committee reforms, or better yet, we should really get, a, get rid of the FISA court. Mm -hmm. Do we really need a secret court to, um, to oversee evidence? Doesn't the court system work well enough um, that's actually a public system. You can still get warrants in secret. You can go before a judge. It's an ex parte. You can get the warrant. You don't have to let the, the, the subject know. Mm -hmm. um, but at least there's some recourse. If you lie on the warrant application, uh, the person can get a lawyer and challenge it. Um, the way the FISA system is, it's, it's just basically trust the government yeah. that they're going to go after people and they're going to have credible information, which we, which we know is bullshit. Uh, by the way, uh, we're talking about the silver, even Republicans, uh, powerful right-wing, Trump-loving Republicans of civil liberties. We're going to be talking more about that with Sergio we come back when, uh, uh, in our next segment because he's kicked, he got kicked off of Twitter for uh, criticisms he made of the Richard Jewell movie. Have you seen the Richard Jewell movie? I have not. It's a very appropriate movie. I'm going to tease uh, our next segment by well, telling you this. I'm looking forward to hearing yeah, this story. Yeah, uh, Richard Jewell was the gentleman who was I falsely remember. accused of setting off a bomb in Atlanta at the Olympics in 1996. Clint Eastwood, who's a, uh, a Republican and very with a strong libertarian streak, uh, has just come out with a movie uh, called Richard Jewell, and it's about the FBI's overreach, essentially, uh, uh, ginning up a false accusation against Richard Jewell and then working in uh, tandem with the media to humiliate him and make it seem as like he did something which he didn't do. But I, I have, I take devilish delight uh, in pointing out that uh, there's the timing couldn't be better because Clint Eastwood, if Leonard, I don't know if you were watching Clint Eastwood movies in the seventies like I obsessively did, Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry. There were no civil liberties no. for the criminals in Dirty Harry. They had information. If you had to step on their leg wound to get them to scream out, Sergio's not his head, he saw to get them to torture them. He was essentially um, supporting torture if it would elicit information that could lead to uh, the uh, apprehension of a, a dangerous criminal. Now, in the age of Donald Trump, Republicans have discovered civil liberties, and he's done a movie testifying to how the FBI abused. I, I don't believe it's a coincidence that uh, we have the Horowitz report showing that the FBI uh, overplayed its hand, to put it mildly, in accumulating evidence against uh, Trump's associates, uh, and suddenly a clamor from the right for the need to defend civil liberties. At least you're legitimate. You were for civil liberties back in 2003. Correct. Correct. 
So yeah, and it's I mean it's a shame that the Democrats that were always skeptical of these agencies are now you know celebrating and saying that th these are our savior. You know the, the people that practice the dark arts um, are going to save us from Donald Trump. You know I, I think that's a very dangerous. Uh, your your last column uh, was sort of a celebration of uh, Manning, Chelsea Manning, and uh, Julian Assange. Talk about that. Well, um, you know Manning's back in prison. I think uh, you know the people that read that column. A lot of them, you know, were, were saying, "I didn't realize that that Manning was back in prison." Well, why is she back in prison? Is because they need her to say um, that that Assange uh, conspired with her to steal information from the army databases. And the reason they need that is because otherwise Assange is no different from the New York Times or the Guardian or any other mainstream paper that, that published um, Manning's information that Manning uh, that was leaked. And uh, you know they're protected by the First Amendment. So they need Manning to say something that the government knows is almost certainly not true. Mm -hmm. And that is that Assange uh, is not just a publisher, but that he's actually you know, a computer hacker and a, a thief. And, you know, that is a shame. And I think this is, you know, it kind of goes back to the Horowitz Report, too, is that, you know, we have a federal government that relies so much on people's words. They don't necessarily care if it's true. You know, I've tried many, many federal cases. I'm representing a guy right now that's in federal prison for life uh, for drugs. They didn't find any drugs on him. Uh, there was no physical evidence against him. They just paid informants. And that is they let people out of jail to say that they bought their drugs from my client, Yuka. Um, and an all-white jury uh, convicted him, and, sent, and the judge sent him away for life. And you know, this is, you know, this is. I, I think this is one of the reasons why I, I, I have sort of a recurring theme in my columns of you know saying watch out for the federal government because, um, you know, at least the the state system, there are some checks and balances, and you know, it's really. Um, first of all, this, the state prosecutors, it's, it's a, an arrest-driven system, so you have. You know, there's an arrest, and the file ends up on a prosecutor's desk, and they, they prosecute. Uh, the feds pick and choose their cases, mm -hmm. and they can spend five years investigating you, Ben Jarofsky, without you even knowing it, um, um, and look for something um, to, to, get, to get against you. Now, um, people don't worry about that because they tend to trust their government, but, you know, it, you may... You may trust your government if you're not doing anything that that um, causes the government to have fear of you. But once uh, once you are um, in their crosshairs, they have a lot of tools to get mm -hmm. you, and it doesn't have to be true. And I think that's one thing you learned from this this Horowitz report. It doesn't have to be true to get a, a very intense surveillance against you. Well, I, I when you said people trust their governments. Uh, they sort of pick and choose. They're cafeteria trusters, if you follow me. They pick and choose. Uh, so, for instance, right now, uh, when Donald Trump rages against uh, the, the deep state, uh, a lot of Republicans, Trump lovers, don't trust the government. And they think there are these uh, malicious uh, ne'er-do-wells buried within the system that are trying to undo the election. Uh, when people go to Clint Eastwood, clearly doesn't trust the government. Uh, his last two or two of his last three movies have been all about government overreach, one about Sully. I don't know if you saw that one, but uh, it, it talked about uh, the, the pilot who landed the plane right. uh, uh, in the, what was it, the Hudson River and, and in New York, saved everybody on the plane, but then he turned that into a condemnation of the, the federal oversight in uh, into the investigation as though he was a victim, once again, of government intrusion. Same thing in the Richard Jewell report. Uh, so, so, you know, it's... I've, I've noted this, uh, Leonard, when I, I just take such delight in this. When people run against an incumbent in Chicago, they rail against the machine. And when they lose the election, they always tell me, because they feel I'm going to be a sympathetic, sympathetic audience, well, you can't beat the, you know what the machine's up to, Ben. And then when they get elected, they join the machine. You get what I'm saying? So that trust that you talk about the government it's 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 like a negotiable thing like you get what i'm saying right now uh democrats or a lot of democrats love the fbi it's weird do you watch all the fbi shows that are on like the fbi is venerated on a lot of shows like unbelievable if you or yeah, uh, a lot of no i'm 
you know, your next guest is one of the most knowledgeable and on movies. I'm one of the least okay. knowledgeable. <laughs> um, I did see the report. I heard you talking yes. about that movie. Um, that was a good movie. Yeah. Uh, very, it gets at a lot of the issue. I've talked a lot about the reports, gets a lot of the issues. Uh, I should let you go, Leonard Goodman. And uh, he's, uh, so, by the way, you talk about Blago. You're, the first time you came on my show, it's talk about what your perhaps best known client is former Governor Bogoyevich. Anything new in that case? Not that I, um, not that I have heard. You know, I was kind of hoping. You know, it's the Christmas season um, that perhaps President Trump would um, do the right thing, and you know, recognize that this man never took a penny. Um, he's sitting there. Um, his family needs him to come back home. It's time, and you know, I, I, I still have some hope. But it's you know, I guess Trump's got other things on his mind. <laughs> But, you know, I uh, well, you know me where I stand in this. I never got along with Bogoyevich when he was governor. 14 years is ridiculous and absurd uh, over punishment. And uh, if you're depending on Donald John Trump to do the right thing, that's a long shot, uh, Leonard Goodman. But, well, uh, you know, our last <laughs> president, uh, Barack Obama, had a chance to do the right thing and he didn't do it. In, so, in the case of Bogoyevich. In the case yeah. of Bogoyevich. Um, he knew more than anyone that the case was bullshit. Um, but all right, Leonard, uh, have a great new year's. We'll get you back in January. Uh, Leonard Goodman, you could read his stuff at the reader. Uh, what, how often would you write about once, once uh, a month, once a month. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, I urge everybody to check out the, my, my, uh, democratic listeners were really pissed off because Assange WikiLeaks, of course, was the site, the site that dumped all the democratic emails. Let's not forget that, uh, which, ripped open all the Bernie Hillary uh, scars. But, you know, didn't we have a right to, to see that information, you know? The, well, I have mixed feelings about well, this. Well, first of all, I mean, didn't we have a right to know that the, the primary was rigged? That's first of all, um, that the DNC was working with the Clinton campaign, um, you know, against Bernie. And do we I have think, a right to know that or did uh, was that important information that we should have? I'm not sure we had a right to know that, but I definitely think it was important information. But as somebody who wanted Donald John Trump to lose, I was really irritated, to okay. put it mildly. Okay. Uh, and But you know what? i got to tell you this, Leonard. I have to say this, that I'm a big boy. I understand that happens. Uh, I My problem with uh, lefties and Trumpsters on this issue is they want to pretend as though... Uh, uh, the the hackers had nothing to do with Russia, and I get uh, people come on the show, uh, and you know the far left persuasion, and they say they just want to overlook that fact. So I think it's well, when you're digging for the truth. Well, we haven't seen any evidence, though, Ben. That's the one thing I would I would caution you is where is the evidence that Russia actually um, hacked into the DNC. Uh, servers other They're, than the testimony of all the the uh, intelligence agencies in this that country say which we, we, have, we have strong <laughs> yeah, belief okay. that's what they said about weapons of mass destruction yes you know i like to see evidence all I'm right a lawyer point. let's come on I, and so that's why i say open up let's have hearings on it uh sure uh, i'm all for that I'm, i welcome it all leonard have a great new year's and we'll get you back oh, on next it's month. always fun ben. Uh, that's Thank leonard you. goodman uh sergio mims on deck can't wait to talk about how they kicked him off of twitter for speaking his mind about richard jewell we're right back with sergio Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture, food, arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. Did you know that 40% of the people in Illinois opt to be cremated? Well, it's true. And Chicagoland Cremation Options honors their wishes by providing cremation services directly to the general public. Chicagoland Cremation Options provides an affordable, ethical, and easy cremation arrangement, whether in person or online. Save thousands and streamline the process by going directly to Chicagoland Cremation Options. It's a family-owned business operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. Here's how you reach them. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. One more time. ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. It's Chicagoland's Adult Entertainment Playground. 
It's the world famous Admiral Theater, 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. The Admiral is homegrown from Chicago, and it's the most conveniently located club in all of the city. 15 minutes from the O'Hare Airport in downtown Chicago Loop. Voted Chicago's best strip club, the Admiral has showgirls galore and a variety of adult entertainment shows. The world famous Admiral Theater, open every day from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. 3940 West Lawrence Avenue. For events, showtime, and other information, visit AdmiralX.com. Must be 18 years of age or older to enter. I do want to say that we understand and we're very grateful that you're here. We are giving you an hour of substance and talk on our airwaves. So this audience has a lot of Democrats in it. It has uh, Republicans, independents, Democratic socialists, conservatives. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Okay, now of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? Millions of people every single year lose their health insurance. You know why? They get fired or they quit and they go to another employer. I was a mayor for eight years. You know what I did, what probably every mayor in America does, is you look around for the best insurance program, the most cost-effective insurance. You change insurance every year. Millions of workers wake up in the morning and their employer has changed the insurance that they have. Maybe they like the doctors. People are nodding their heads. Okay, so this is not new every year. Now, what we're talking about actually is stability, that when you have a Medicare for all, it is there now and will be there in the future. We've been unpacking this for a while now, y'all. That's that's the issue there, and we're still being told no. Look, um, it doesn't make sense to us, as it doesn't make sense to you, and here we are. So when people say teachers have not compromised, or that we want everything and we've given nothing, not true. No, no. Not true. Not true. Is there anything more specific you can tell us about what class size enforcement means in this tentative agreement? Let me tell you about. Let me tell you one component of it. Number one, class size is going to um, encompass the entire city of Chicago. That's one thing. Um, that it has an enforcement mechanism that comes with resources to enforce it. But perhaps one of the most important things, I'm a teacher, I'm a high school history teacher, and I've taught in communities, Inglewood, Humboldt Park, and North Lawndale. And in those um, neighborhoods, we have less resources um, than we should have. Hey, thanks for holding down the fort there, Stacey Davis-Gates. Hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, December 26th is just moments away. But before we get into that, we need to thank the following unions for sponsoring this program. First up, it's the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. A giant thank you to those unions for sponsoring this program. And, of course, today's Ben Jarofsky show is brought to you by our dear friends, dear friends, I say, at the Chicago Federation of Labor, hour number two. Let's go. It is Thursday, December 26th. And live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, it is the oh-so-long, wait, long-awaited return of director of the Black Harvest Film Festival, the one, the only, Sergio Mims. Now your host, the oh-so-long-awaited return, 
Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Sergio Mims in the studio is going to tell us about, uh, we've been talking about civil liberties uh, with uh, Leonard Goodman. What about Sergio Mims' civil liberties? Yeah, what about they, kicked, they kicked him off Twitter because he dared to criticize Clint Eastwood. How, how about well, that? Okay. Well, we'll get into this. Okay. You got an update for me, young man? Uh, actually, yes, we do have an update here. Uh, just hang tight with me one second. We're going to be, uh, before we get out of here, we're going to find out two more new laws happening in the year 2020. It's our 20 new laws of 2020 special. Uh, but before we do that, our dear friend on the YouTube live stream chat, Brianna, weighed in and asked us a great question. Brianna asks, hey, Dennis, when, what is the show schedule for next week? Although I will be... Um, somewhat distracted on January 1st. Then she put a bunch of smoke and tree emojis <laughs> yeah. applying. She's going to be smoking that legal marijuana. Yeah. So uh, great question, Brianna. And here's the answer. Tuesday, December 31st, we will have a live new Ben Jarofsky show. Wednesday, January 1st, no live new Ben Jarofsky show. Thursday, January 2nd, a live new Ben Jarofsky show. Friday, January 3rd, you guessed it, a live new Ben Jarofsky show. So New Year's Day is when we're taking the day off. We're taking the day off. We're the hardest working podcasters in the business. We took Christmas Day off. We worked the rest of this week. And uh, on the day before uh, New Year's, I got uh, Milo Samarja. I urge everyone, you're going to love Milo, an old friend of mine. He's uh, Since it's the day before Sergio, uh, marijuana becomes legal, I thought I'd get an old friend who's been smoking marijuana since the 60s to come on and talk about <laughs> <laughs> He knows more about marijuana. Just the guy knows so much about marijuana. Uh, like, for instance, for 10 trivia points, who is Louis Armstrong's dealer? Did you know, do you know the answer I to that? I knew Louis Armstrong smoked, but I didn't hey, know who was his dealer. Who was his dealer? I forget the guy's name. See, yeah. I don't... Uh, it was a Jewish guy uh, who was a real character... Wrote a book. I kept blanking on his name. Oh boy, Ben uh, You only get yeah. to ask trivia questions. He doesn't, doesn't know, know the answer, answer himself. But he wrote a book. He was a hipster, uh, and he got arrested. He got busted for smoking reefer. And back in those days, the jails of New York were de racially divided. He asked to mm -hmm. be put into the cells with the black people, Negroes, as they were called back in those days, Sergio. Colored the, folk. Colored folk. Yeah, with the colored folk. Mm -hmm. He asked to be put in. You know who else Misro, was? I think his name is Misro. You know who else was a um, big marijuana smoker? Who? James Gardner. James Gardner? Yeah. From The Great Escape, James Gardner? Yeah. Matter of fact, it's a strain of marijuana named after him called the Bomb Gardner. I did which is not his know original that. name. Yeah. Yeah. His, I now, did not know I got to say that. I don't do it. I'm a clean liver. I don't. But I, by the way, pick up the new issue of The Reader. It's High Times. I mean, basically, it's, it's basically, all marijuana. Yeah, it's all marijuana all the time. And uh, it, oh, I didn't talk about this with Leonard Goodman, but uh, uh, there was a proposal, my article in The Reader. I, I talked about this last week. Uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, at one point when she was trying to stave off the reefer revolt, black aldermen uh, revolting against mm -hmm. the fact that yeah. somehow or other they, they're doling out these licenses to sell reefer, they couldn't find any black people to get a license. Uh, so they were going to delay implementation of the law for six months to to stave that off. She tried out the proposal that we use TIF funds to set up cultivation centers in black neighborhoods that would be uh, run by black people. That the idea being that let them get into the business mm -hmm. this way. And I said, well, that's the first appropriate use of TIF funds I've seen from the city yeah, in a long, man. long time. By the way, I don't disagree with what those aldermen did. Yeah. But I think they were late. I think they should have been on top of it beforehand. Yeah. You should have realized what was going on. Well, I got to tell you this. We had a lot of, we're on a tangent within a tangent. We want to get back to yeah. uh, your, your your war with Twitter. But it's interesting how Chicago politics works. And I'm not going to name names because a lot of these are off-the-record conversations that happen on the show after the mics are turned off. But a lot of my guests are ripping, ripping the black aldermen. And uh, there's this strain in Chicago politics that if somebody takes a step out of the box and makes another politician look bad by taking mm -hmm. a bold stand, the, the impulse is to criticize the alderman who's taking the strong stand, undercut the credibility of what they're saying. Do you follow what I'm, do you see what yeah, I'm getting at? I'm surprised because they were, their argument is right. Their argument is right. I just felt they should have been ahead of, she, they should have done it earlier yeah. instead of when it comes to them and then, hey, wait a minute, we didn't know this. You should have known this before. Yeah. You, come on, you're a Chicago politician. You know the game is rigged. So you should have been on top of that before you find out at the vote. That's why I criticize them, not for their protest. I absolutely agree with them, 100%. It was too late in coming, you're saying. Right. Uh, 
D, you got an update? You, you, what, did I cut you off for your update? I just want to let uh, our good friend uh, on the live stream chat, Doogie. It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Doogie. Thanks for uh, following us. Uh, and uh, he used to listen to us, uh, you know, back on the old show. So, Doogie, thank you so much for finding us. W, after... what, uh, here's your hat with your hurry. You're right. yeah. W, you are fired. Yeah, thanks for finding us after you know who was fired. And thanks for listening along. You're awesome. So, uh, shout out to uh, Doogie. And coming up before we get out of here, we will do two uh, new laws coming to Twitter. And we'll take a break right before the hour. And, so, and once again, to recap, uh, we'll have live shows Tuesday, December 31st. Thursday, January 2nd, Friday, January 3rd, all live new Ben Jarofsky shows. Wednesday, no new show. And tomorrow we'll have a show. Stacey Davis Gates will be here. We'll be taking the deep dive on all the political issues today. His with... brother has become a star. Yes. I just saw another interview with him a few weeks ago. Henry Davis, the councilman from South Bend, Indiana. Boy, who's... he's running that. <laughs> he's <laughs> running <laughs> Poor Poor <laughs> uh, Pete, you should have called Henry Davis. I tried to tell you that. You started it. I started it, yeah. If it wasn't for you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all of this wouldn't have happened. Well, now he's a media star. Yeah, no, Henry Davis, uh, big time media. He was on, uh, I think he was on Fox TV. Uh, he, of course, is Stacey Davis Gates' uh, brother. He's a councilman. In, in South Bend. He ran against Mayor Pete back in 2015 for mayor. Uh, and he points out, I makes a very convincing argument, uh, Sergio, that Mayor Pete uh, is a big phony when it comes to racial issues. And, well, yeah. And dealing with Gee, he didn't know there was segregation <laughs> in South Bend. Yeah. Gee, who'd have thunk it? Yeah. Um, so let's get to my problem. All right, let's Before we do that, <laughs> stop the presses. Frank has weighed in. What's going on, Frank? Frank is letting us know Louis Armstrong, his weed dealer's name was Mez Mesro. Yes, Correct. Mez Mesro. I told you. What... Frank, God bless you. Mez Mez. This dude wrote a book, and uh, what a character he was. They should make a movie about Mez Mesro. What a character he was. All right, let's talk about what happened to you okay. with Twitter. All right. Okay, let me preface to say, I've only been on Twitter for a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm still on Facebook and on Instagram, but um, Twitter for only a year. Okay? (laughs) And a couple months ago, I tweeted a comment about Candace Owen. You know who Candace Owen is? Yes, but tell the listeners who. Candace Owen is this fraud who the ultra-right loves. She's the black woman who says all the things they love to say, that black people are worthless and, you know, you know, well, we can get a black person to say it, so it's not that bad. But she's a fraud. If you know her background, she's as phony as a $3 bill. All right. And I, I tweeted to somebody that she was, how do I call it? She was uh, a, a bootlicking lawn jockey. That's what I said. Mm. Twitter says, we're going to suspend you for six days because you can't say that's right. And I said, that's what she is. Wait, time out. So how did... I think we talked about this in the air, but I can't remember. How did Twitter find out that you wrote? I mean, there's millions and millions of people writing all millions and millions of things on Twitter. Well, How did they find um, that out? From what I understand now, one person has ah, to say something and report it. I see. All right. So it was a snitch. It was a snitch. <laughs> okay. So, so what happens, the, the, the Richard Jewell movie comes out. Wait, and, time out. So you were kicked off for six days. Six days. For, for writing that about Candace Owen. Right. But then after six days, they let you back on. Yeah, right. Is there an appeal process? Can you appeal the decision or is that it? No. You're just, okay, but go ahead. That's if how they, it works. Well, let me tell you what happened. All right. Okay. So go ahead. So uh, I, a, a friend of mine, film critic friend of mine, we're all film critics, we all belong to the same organization, um, he posted a, uh, a tweet about the Richard Jewell film, which I really did not like. Mm-hmm. And um, he was more or less trying to give it the benefit of a doubt. And and if you see the movie... I've not seen the movie. Okay. This is Clint Eastwood's latest movie. I've not okay. seen it. Uh, uh, Olivia Wilde mm-hmm. plays a real character by the name of Scruggs. She was the reporter at the Lanston Constitution Journal mm-hmm. who first broke the story that the FBI had him under suspicion. I had Richard Jewell under suspicion. And the Jewell under suspicion. What did I say? Sorry. No, no, you had it right. Okay. I was just saying who the he right. was. Go ahead. He had Richard Jewell under suspicion. Mm-hmm. In the film, in the movie, she's portrayed as this wanton slut who will sleep with anybody or will suggest you sleep with anybody to get information. Mm -hmm. That is an old sexist trope that you have seen in movies for 50 years, longer than that. The female reporter, male reporters in movies are already hardworking people. Female reporters always have to sleep around. Uh, Absence of malice. Sally Field. Sally Field. A lot of movies where the reporter sleeps around to get information. Mm -hmm. 
As a matter of fact, um, Romana yeah, Hussein, Hussein was talking that about up. this. Yes, she was. Okay. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, it is it's it's clear that she is sleeping with this FBI agent. To, she got the info that they were looking at Richard. In Jewell. the Richard Jewell movie. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. So my comment to my friend was, no, the message of this film is pity oh the four the poor obese redneck white guy who is the victim of government overreach and the fake media personified by a female whore reporter. You, this is what you wrote. That's what I wrote. Okay. Because that's what she is in the picture. Yeah. Did you put it in quotes? Did you put no, female whore? No, someone told me that later. Okay. I, I did not. All right, go okay? ahead. Mm-hmm. But it's clear I'm talking about how the characters are represented in the film and what Clint Eastwood's message is. Okay. Two days later... You're permanently banned on on, on get, Facebook. Where, how, on do they, how do they? How uh, do they? you get a notification. You get, you get a notification saying you're banned. I see. Okay. Uh, now you can appeal, you and can I did. Appeal. Okay. I did, and they rejected it. Wait, time out. So, uh, what what was the basis of your appeal? What did you stipulate in your? I appeal? said that I was referring to a character in a movie, a fictionalized character in a movie, not the real person, not the actress. I'm referring to the message behind the movie mm-hmm. as a critical analysis. That's why they said what I wrote to them. Still no good for them. They banned me for life. Now, I can still go on Twitter and read. People can't tweet to me anymore. I can't tweet out. I can still go on Twitter and read other people's tweets. Uh, but I can't do that anymore. Now, see, people say you can change your name. I mean, change your handle and all that stuff. I don't want to go through with that. Because if I keep have to constantly think about what am I saying, if it'll get me in trouble, it's not worth it anymore mm-hmm. to me. Right. I want to be able to say if if I say a fictionalized character is a whore in a film. Yeah. Let me I should have the right to say that I am not attacking a person, a real person. I am attacking a fictionalized character in a movie. Right. Or if I say somebody is a boot, boot licking lawn jockey, that's my opinion <laughs> of her. I'm not threatening her. That's what she is. Yeah. And by the way, there are racists and Nazis and Donald Trump who can say anything they want to on to it. By the way, I would still be going on Twitter. You'd be amazed at what people are saying mm-hmm. about anybody, about women, about black people, about anything. They have no problem. Well, what do you think trip? the wire with you once again somebody must have reported me somebody said oh and freaked out <laughs> how do you spell that i don't know you figure it out <laughs> um so when when they turned down your appeal yeah all right so this is all i'm just curious the process are you sending emails to some twitter account yeah, yeah, you, you don't have you, a name yeah, of anybody. On Twitter, you can go on a link and you can write. This is what. Okay, blah, so blah, this blah, is blah, my blah. defense. This is my and, defense, right? And, and there's and then he sent me an email back about a week and a half later, telling me, "Sorry, no, you're still going to be banned." So, do they uh, make any attempt to counter the argument you made, or no. do they just say, "Sorry, you're banned"? Yeah, yes, so it's it's not in any way like a legitimate. Uh, or a hearing where there's a hearing officer who renders an opinion. It's they banned you. You appealed. Yeah. Uh, and they said, sorry, we're, you're still banned. Yeah. That's it. All right. Uh, so what do you, when you look back on this, uh, do you think there's a double standard that uh, people uh, with your point of view? Are yeah, well, I'll tell you what the double standard is. The Go. double standard is particularly black, twi- pe- black people. Because I know other, I, I, for example, I have a friend of mine who does a history website a black history website and also current events, right? Mm -hmm. She practically has been almost been banned off of Facebook. And she says, I'm just posting facts about black history, but they deem it's threatening. So um, she doesn't really do much anymore because, and I said, well, what did you do? She said, I didn't do anything. I just posted about what fact happened in black history at this time in this day. He mm-hmm. says threatening. I've heard of other um, black people who have been banned from Twitter or from Facebook. Some of them have been um, managed to get back on. You know? And I go, well, what is this? Well, you can see my face. I had my face, you know, on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I had a so Twitter So they picture. know you're black. Yeah, yeah. That's the only thing I can think of mm-hmm. because... 
I, some of the things you, some of the things I still have read since I've been banned on Twitter are pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And once again, if I keep now, look, if you're threatening somebody, that's understandable. If you're saying anything that is um, racially, you know, derogative towards somebody, of course, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're stating an opinion or something, you know, and somebody somewhere you don't know who is. I bet it was some millennial. <laughs> Play with the millennials. <laughs> I bet it was. By the way, on a tangent with a tangent, you see the article in the Tribune that millennials are the worst tippers? I meant to give you a hard time about that, D. They don't have any money. I, <laughs> broke, broke ass millennials. And by the way, <laughs> yeah. let me tell you something about millennials. Stop crying about you had lousy jobs when you graduated from college. You remember all the lousy jobs I had when I graduated from college? Uh, it's not a new thing. Yeah, no, it's definitely you not. You know, once I sold thing. aluminum siding... No, I did not know that. After I graduated from college, when you do job. lousy jobs. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a tough racket. Anyway, let's go back. So in uh, in retrospect, had you put the quotes around the word? Uh, what, yeah, because I talked to my friends and he said you should have done that, but I didn't. You know, first of all, I don't know, like, because I've only been in it for a year, mm-hmm. right? Is there particular rules? I still don't yeah. know about them. Okay. Well, at the point is, what was the what, what was the phrase you said? Uh, so what was the word in front of uh, the adjective in front of whore that you used? Female whore. Female reporter. whore. Okay. Right. Had you put the quotes around female whore reporter, you would have sending you would have been sending a message that this is not your uh, point of view uh-huh. that you're merely summarizing the uh, sort of the 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 point of view that Clint Eastwood was uh, admitting when he made his movie. Right. Okay, so you're saying... And also, uh, don't forget, with Twitter, you, Twitter, you only have so, many, amount, so, yeah. many, so much space, right? And I hate to do multiple tweets. Yeah. I didn't like to do that. So I try to make as compact as I can, mm-hmm. right? But I thought it was pretty obvious because my friend responded to my tweet, mm-hmm. and I responded back to him, and then he responded back. Yeah. So um, he understood. I assume other people understood what I was getting at. Mm-hmm. about this movie all right now uh having said all that by the way i just don't think you're meant for twitter so it's probably probably weird. not uh but but it is very inconsistent inconsistent and i'm not quite certain if by the rules of the game why they allow donald trump to put the stuff he puts out there uh you know and like but, i said i've only been in know. it for a year i didn't even bother with it yeah and then maybe a year literally a year ago i said well let me try this twitter yeah. thing what is that and i've only been on instagram even less than that yeah. before it was just facebook facebook is fine but you know my rule. Uh, if what was my age limit? If you're above the age of fifty, you should be not allowed to go on Twitter. Maybe that's a point. Uh, I think just Twitter is for um, teenagers. All right. Uh, anyway, having said all that, mm-hmm. uh, your thoughts on Richard Jewell? This, of course, this movie has some cultural significance, as I was saying uh, to Leonard when we were having the conversation with Leonard Goodman. Uh, is that th- there's been an evolution of attitude on the part of the right? I appreciate I appreciate any defenders of civil liberties, but uh, where were you when we needed you when the FBI came in and killed Fred Hampton well, when he was sleeping? Let me tell you how heavy-handed this movie is. All right, um, Sam Rockwell plays the lawyer, the real-life lawyer who defended Jewel. I see. And there are several scenes where he's in his office and he has this poster behind him and in the corner of the poster you see i fear terrorists more than i fear the government okay mm-hmm. and that you see that at least four times in the movie where he's sitting at his desk and you see that you can't miss it right mm-hmm. and i said gee that's a bit <laughs> heavy-handed i guess i know what clean eastwood is trying to tell us so this is the lawyer for Richard Jewell. Right. I fear. T- well, when you, that message, I fear terrorists more than I feel like. Uh, no, fear- no, 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 I, no. I'm sorry. I got it wrong. Yeah. I'm, I'm just so, going to say. I got it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm, wrong. I'm so sorry. I, f- I fear the government more than I fear terrorists. I'm correct. sorry. Yeah. Say, Robert that's Ball. the yeah. quote. No, that. That's the quote. Okay. And that is a complete 180 from where Clint Eastwood was in the 1970s. Mm-hmm where he made fun of civil libertarians. He mocked them, and he said civil libertarians are the people who worry about the the rights of murderers and rapists, that thus la- leaving them free to go back and murder and rape, okay? And um, so if you flip the switch 40 years later, essentially Clint Eastwood is saying that I the civil liberties matter more to me than murder and rapists 
Yeah. And people who blow up planes, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah. It's a, a very profound uh, reversal, put it that way, of, of attitudes in this country. The right country. will change any way they'll go just to yeah. get their way. Yeah. Right? Well, there's a fight going on. There's a political battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so t they have to be civil libertarians now. Right. If Donald Trump is ousted, uh, in the next election, I don't believe he'll be impeached in a million years, but if he's ousted in the next next election and a Democrat is, I don't care who the Democrat is, the right will drop its support for civil liberties. So of course they will. You're looking for support from the right on civil liberties. You're not going to get it uh, unless it's a person of the right being persecuted. Of course they will. All right. That's, uh, so it's, the movie's not worth watching. I didn't like it. Okay. But is it worth watching from a historical perspective or anything? Well. By the way, do they mention who actually did the bombing? No. They don't even do it at the end. With no, the no, no, no. The only thing they say at the end is when Richard Jewell died because he died about 10 years ago. Yeah. They don't even mention that the reporter died before him. She died just five years later. Yeah. Scruggs. In real, she died 2001, 2002. Of, um, she suffered from mental health issues. Um, but, she, but that's not mentioned. It's just Richard Jewell died of you know, heart attack in 2008. Yeah. That's it. All right, I, I, I think I managed to uh, avoid Oh, and then his system. lawyer got married, and now they have kids. Okay, so. all right, I'll probably watch it uh, when it's at the red box. All right, uh, moving from uh, the unjust banning of Sergio from Twitter, although I think they did you a favor. Now you have more time to do other it's things. Fine. I really do. Uh, like get movies for uh, uh, the Black Harvest Fe F Film Festival. By the way, do you have I'm any... Working, I'm working on stuff right now as we speak. All right, so you're not I'm allowed to say I'm working on stuff as we speak. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, it was funny because I was just talking about Crooklyn. I was in talking about Crooklyn on this very show with a couple of millennials a couple of days ago mm -hmm. and i was explaining the significance of of crooklyn because uh, the one of the millennials is a black millennial and he was saying this is a tangent within a tangent but you'll get a kick out of it he was saying that when he was growing up his parents would not allow him to watch a tv show unless there was at least one black character on it okay well, why don't you tell him when i was growing up when you saw a black person on a TV show, Mom, Dad, <laughs> quick, yeah. quick. He went, oh, man, you're too late. He was right there. <laughs> he was, he little... was right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that may be why in Crooklyn is that great scene where all the kids are sitting around the TV watching the Partridge family. And I was trying to tell them, oh, did you miss the... If, if 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 the family in Crooklyn, the parents in Crooklyn had the same attitude, you would that great scene where they're watching the Partridge. Um, hey, that's one of my favorite scenes. Of so now we got to talk about since no, I've been no, the subject have, yes. of discussion. All right, we he was uh, Sergio was maligned by a certain Monroe Anderson. Okay, now you know I talked to him yesterday. I didn't bring it up. All right, all right. So here you want to do the introduction, or should I do the introduction? Remind people what it was the Sergio Mims theory. Okay. All right. No, oh. you bring it up. Right. You, you, you start it up, and then I'll yeah. And yeah, this okay. is Sergio Mims' theory. This is not the Ben Jarofsky theory. This is Sergio Mims' theory, mm -hmm. and it emanated. Sergio World. Yeah, Sergio World. Um, we were talking about Kamala Harris mm -hmm. and why her campaign uh, fell apart, uh, and we were talking about uh, Cory Booker and why Joe Biden is getting more black support than mm -hmm. Cory Booker. Right. And the Sergio Mims theory is that black voters have made a very, quote unquote, pragmatic decision. Mm -hmm. uh, they have come to the conclusion that Barack Obama was largely a disappointment in terms of delivering on the goods. Symbolically, it was important. Uh, black voters love Barack and mm -hmm. Michelle. And they still do. They still, they love, they're going to buy Michelle's book, right? They brought the hell out of it. They bought the hell out of it. They filled the United Center when she came to the United you Center. You believe it. And for those prices? For those prices. Wow. Uh, and, uh, but they've made a very pragmatic, practical decision when it comes to uh, elections that a black president will only go so far at delivering the goods that they'll pull back. Is that the well, Sergio theory or is it there more, a little more? A little bit more, oh, go right? Ahead. Maybe the right black candidate is not one now, right? Okay. Turns to Cory Booker, we can swear in the show, right? Yes, okay. you can swear. <laughs> Everybody does. Okay. Except Except Cory Booker yeah. is that he's corny as fuck. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. the only way I can do it. I mean, this is a guy who <laughs> at, on a debate said Dag Nabbit. Yes, he did. <laughs> what, what is he, Walter Brennan? Yeah. Okay, forget him, okay? Mm -hmm. And don't forget, Duval Patrick is still running. 
Yes. The guy who twice already had to cancel speeches because no one showed up. Yeah. Twice already. Okay. Now, Kamala Harris. Look, don't let me start with Kamala Harris already. All right, hold okay. on. Let me have some of that Kamala. Yeah, Kamala. Kamala. Oh, yes. Mm. Mm, delicious. <laughs> oh, boy. Delicious. So, okay. F first of all, they tried to present her as Obama 2.0, yeah. which she never was in the first place. Uh, when she was attorney general of California and a district attorney, mm -hmm. she had no relationship with the black community. This is a this is a this is a person who, at the beginning of her campaign, gave an interview at TV One. You can find it anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, in which she was asked, "What's your agenda for African Americans?" And she looked at the reporter with this incredulous look on in her face, and she and she said. I'm not going to do anything that's only going to benefit black people. No. Oh, really? <laughs> hey, Donald Trump has no problem doing things that only benefit white guys. Yeah. Right? Oh, but she's got a problem. Then, when that, evidently her handers told her, boy, that was bad. Okay? Then she did, well, let me try to appeal to black voters in the worst way, clumsiest way possible, because she has no relationship w w with us. So what she did, first she's dancing to Cardi B, right? You know, the video where she's dancing, please, you're not listening to Cardi B. Yeah. She's talking about, oh, she only wears Converse. Converse, what, you're 1986? <laughs> okay. Then, yeah. then she, uh, oh, th then the killer, when she goes on that radio show, The, Bre the Breakfast Club, mm -hmm. or The Breakfast Schlubs, yeah. as, they, as I call them, and you're talking about how, tee hee hee, I smoked reefer when I was in college, tee hee hee, and I inhaled, tee hee. <laughs> oh, the same stuff that you put in over 1,500 black people in prison for, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That same stuff, same person who claimed, when I was in college, I listened to Tupac about a decade before he arrived on the scene. Or And then the latest thing, latest thing she would do is the marching bands. She would have these marching bands from historic HBCUs, uh -huh. and she's dancing with them. Black people, you, you're not fooling us, you know? We, you know, all politicians pander to black voters. White, black, Republicans, they do it really badly. Um, <laughs> conser uh, the Democrats, you know. Uh, well, Donald Trump doesn't really pander, does he? Well, he's, in his own way, when he brings Kanye, I suppose. That's, yeah, that's that's really what. Yeah. He doesn't know him from a hole in the wall. Do you remember that scene? I know it's, I'm cutting you off, but that scene where, remember that one? It was unbelievable. Kanye was in the White House. I know, with Trump. doing his coon show act. Now, if I said that on Twitter, they would have banned. Oh my God! But what we say the Ben Jarofsky show is the, the views and opinions of Sergio right. Mims are oh, you know, so and anyway. Jim Brown was in the room. Yeah, Jim Brown was. Uh, that was sad. What the hell happened to him? Well, he's okay. Know, so anyway, Jim Brown. Um, Don't say anything bad about Jim Brown. I still can't. You know, I just but, but, love Jim Brown. You know, it's like what's that, Stacy Dash? Uh, yeah, Stacy Dash. Okay. Yeah. No I mean, matter. First, first I was like, St you mean Stacy Davis Gates? But no, you're no, talking no, about yeah, Dash, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know mm -hmm. the one who went, you know, the so-called dealers actress and went. Yeah. No matter what she does, I still remember her layout in Playboy. I can never <laughs> okay, really get that off your mind. I All can't. Right. Okay, but here's the thing. So going back the, okay, to your theory. But here's the thing. Okay, so she <laughs> never had any black support in in the first place. Yeah, come she on. never had it, right? And you know she had support from. The Black Congress Congressional Caucus, or Raucous, as I like to call it, <laughs> um, but she never had any support from Black people, and she was not seen. And look what happened: she dropped out, and when she dropped out, she told the truth. The truth was that she couldn't raise money anymore mm -hmm. because she was getting a lot of money from Silicon Valley, and a lot of money from Hollywood, and they basically came to her and said, "We thought you were the one back almost a year ago, and now we realize you're not the mm -hmm. one." You know, and black voters are like any other voters. We, we got to go with the winner. All right. right? So uh, if you're saying uh, of the right, quote unquote, uh, black candidate would have gotten significant black support. Who can you think of that? OK, I'm going to tell you. Go. OK, they did a poll mm -hmm. of, of New Hampshire Democratic voters. Yeah. And he said, who's your number one choice? For uh, president. You know, mm -hmm. president, Democratic candidate. Who was the number one? Can you take a guess? Who was the number one choice? In New Hampshire? Yeah, these were New Hampshire voters. Just now? Yeah, this was about two months ago. Oh, about two months ago? I would say yeah. it was either Elizabeth Warren 
or uh, a Bernie or Pete Buttigieg? One of those three. No. Ooh. The number one choice was Michelle Obama. For real? For real. She was their number one choice. This was a poll. Uh, if I can find it, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. But I, I came across it about two months ago. She was their number one choice. And I'm telling you something, you may laugh at me. If she ran against Trump, she would kill him. She would, it would be a blowout. So that directly contradicts the uh, argument, the, the central thesis, the central tenet of mm -hmm. the Sergio Mims theory. Well, the, yes and no. So what, okay. Because, mm -hmm. because she has always been seen as being more authentic than he was. Uh, than Barack Obama. Right. She's a South Sider, raised and grew up on the South Side. Don't forget, hey, don't forget, when Barack Obama, when he ran against Bobby Rush, mm -hmm. his first yes. campaign, yeah. how did Bob, Bobby Rush beat him? How yes. did Bobby Rush do it? Uh, with the black vote. No, 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 but how, what did Bobby Rush say? What did he do? Well, I don't know. What do, what do you... He said, this guy's not black enough Oh, for yeah, you. yeah. What's this guy from? Yeah. He's not from Chicago. Of his name. He's got a funny name, and yeah. I don't know where this guy yeah. is from, and he's not one of us. Yeah. Now, you can say that's off the ball. Well, that's what I was talking about uh, in the previous segment. Leonard, Barack Obama, I didn't finish the thought, won in Iowa because it was a largely white voting bloc in Iowa. Yeah. Most people in Iowa are white that vote in the Democratic mm -hmm. caucus. And uh, it was the lefties in Iowa, the, the peaceniks in Iowa went with a Barack because they thought of him as the anti-war candidate. Once he won Iowa... Black voters in America were like, whoa, white people in Iowa voted for this now, guy? Now, I will tell you, when Barack Obama f announced he was running, I was with him, you know? And a large part of that was, for, I, I knew who he was, and also because of, like, family thing, my father was a friend of his, okay? So I was for Barack, and I remember so many of my friends were for Clinton. Yeah. They were for Clinton because mm -hmm. he said he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it, until he won Iowa. Then we won Iowa, then everybody changed. That's what right? I'm saying. He right. won Iowa. But 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 <laughs> I was with him from the from the beginning. Okay. Now I can make the argument that now, like a previous guest, okay, I'm disillusioned. You know, maybe I brought the cool. You know, they drank the Kool Aid. You really drank. We all drank the Kool Aid. Well, can't get still. You know, there's a, there's a lot of. <laughs> On Facebook, there's a lot of Obama nostalgia. Oh, where, where is he? We could be him again. Look, he's living his life. He just brought a $12 million house in Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. You know, he's got another home in California. Yeah. He's got this other home in Washington, D.C. He still owns the home near me over in, you know, I Park. You yeah, know, on, Kenwood. On, on, on Greenwood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, uh, so you think Michelle Obama, oh, yeah. if she were in the race, oh, yeah. would be uh, defeating... Well, Biden wouldn't even be in the race if she were in the race. No, he wouldn't. No. So she would be getting the black vote in South Carolina. Oh, you better believe yeah. it. You better believe it. As for Pete Buttigieg, um, as I think it was... It was it Letitia or... Samina. Samina. Um, somebody said the problem with him, of course, is that when they see him, when black voters see him, they, when they see Alfred E. Newman, <laughs> they see yeah. white privilege. Yeah. Here's this kid. Yeah. I would call him a kid, right? And, and by the way, there is a book I heard about that I really got to read. It's called The Best Little Boy in the World, which I ha it came out about 10 years ago. And it, the guy who wrote this book is talking about this whole generation of white gay men who grew up in the 80s and 90s, who were all closeted when they were growing up. Mm -hmm. And so they had all this eternal angst in them and turmoil and frustration. So they had to let it out in some way. So they became super achievers. And there's a whole generation of them. The, you know, uh, Tim Cook of Apple. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect example, yeah. right? Pete Buttigieg, perfect example. He can speak seven languages. He went to uh, Notre Dame. He fought in Afghanistan. Yeah. He's a concert pianist. And it only until later, after they do all these things, they finally they have to convince him to come out yeah. of the closet, right? right? And there's a whole generation of them. And it's, it's called the best little boy in the whole wide I'm world. Check that and he's there. very much of that generation. 
by the way, I just want to say this as as knowledgeable as Pete Buttigieg is, he just didn't he didn't learn about segregation until he started running for president. Is that interesting? He well, speak- no, he didn't learn about it till oh maybe he was ta- gave, gave that speech last summer. <laughs> yeah. Over Wait a minute, at the Wire, Washington. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a a brief break, and then we'll come back and we'll close down with a couple more of the news stories that we're going to close down to. And uh, after our show, uh, Sergio is going to stick around. We're going to do a bonus on the best movies of the year, Mm -hmm. uh, the best movies of the decade. That's right. So a lot of movie talk. Uh, with Sergio Mims. I know a lot of people, when they, they want to hear Sergio talk movies, we've been talking politics. We're going to do some movies with Sergio, but we're going to do it as a bonus feature. We'll be right back after this. Read the Chicago Reader to get up to speed on what's what in Chicago. Culture, food, arts and entertainment, weekly concert listings, weekly event listings, the environment, travel. I can continue, but you get the point. And for all of you Chicago political junkies, raw weekly columns on real city politics from Maya Dukmasova and our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader, free to the public in newsstands throughout the city and online at chicagoreader.com. Read it now and be a more informed Chicagoan. The Ben Jarofsky Show is supported by Northwestern University's part-time master's program in literature and liberal studies. Students learn from dynamic and diverse faculty as they build advanced skills for critical analysis, writing, and research. Evening classes are held on Northwestern's Evanston and Chicago campuses. The spring quarter application deadline is January 15th. Learn more at sps.northwestern.edu slash masters. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Mr. Jarofsky, take us home. All right, Will, to Sergio Mims in the studio. Uh, before we head out the door, uh, well, actually, like, like I said, we're not going to let Sergio head out the door before we start taping uh, the bonus show. Uh, but Sergio and I go through the best movies of the year, the best movies of the decade. Uh, D, you want to do uh, drop a, f- a little more of the new laws? Absolutely. What we're doing here uh, to celebrate the new year, probably the nerdiest thing possible. We're talking about new laws coming to Illinois in the year 2020. Turns out J.B. Pritzker, really busy, like signing legislation. Over 250 laws will be going into place. In God the year. bless him. Oh, yeah, yeah, no kidding. In the year 2020. And the good folks at WTTW Chicago put on their website 20 of the new laws that we should know. It's a Ben Jarofsky Show holiday special here, and we call it, well, it's a simple name, really, the 20 new laws of 2020. That's correct. <laughs> All right. What so is it gives the, it the holiday feel. Yeah, the holiday. Sleigh bells. <laughs> Doesn't right. that sound like the uh, soundtrack to... Uh, a lot of songs. Yeah, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I don't know if you remember the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. All right, right we're going to do two Great laws movie. here, uh, and we can't stress this enough, all right? These laws come from WTTW Chicago, all right? They did all the hard work. We're just reading from their webpage, all right? Go find all 20 laws at their website, WTTW. Uh, just Google it. This new law coming next year involves animal-tested cosmetics. All, cos- all cosmetics that have been tested on animals will be banned in Illinois. SB 0241 prohibits manufacturers from selling cosmetic products developed using an animal test with fines starting at $5,000. The new law incentivizes companies to invest in non-animal testing alternatives, which advocates say are less expensive and more applicable applicable to humans. The law applies to all products manufactured on or after January 1st, 2020. Yeah, we are a blue state. Sergio, we are a blue state. Yeah. That is a, a blue law. That's a democratic law. That's a, a, a rights, looking out for animals law. I don't see a red state uh, passing a law like Has that. Has he signed the bill yet f- to end uh, daylight saving time? Not yet. Okay. Is that, wait, time out. Did that pass? I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it passed. Oh, God. Here, here. Two I months ago? That. Sergio, I've been, I, I'm dyslexic. I have a lot, a lot of trouble with daylight savings time, just mm-hmm. the whole concept. So here, here, get rid of it. Daylight savings time. All right, let's do another law. I agree huh? with you. I just, uh, I hate daylight. It, 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 it wrecks me because three o'clock, you can always yeah. already see the light. Yeah. Uh, by the way, but this is, we're already having longer days. Teaching you a little something. Now, that's true. Right? Yeah, the days are a little. 
Yeah, Longer. Yeah, that is true. You guys been all my life. <laughs> that is true. On to the next law. <laughs> Got these guys teach me about daylight savings time. All right. <laughs> this next law is all about ensuring jury pool diversity. SB 1378 prohibits the exclusion of anyone from jury duty on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Ensuring jury pools represent the diversity of Illinois is a vital part of ensuring our criminal justice system is fair, said Senator Toy Hutchinson, hey, Reefer Zar, Reefer Zar, who sponsored the measure when it passed in August. Yeah, well, this won't stop, in my humble opinion, prosecutors or defense lawyers from like making those snap judgments of jurors, prospective jurors, uh, Sergio, and they're like, uh, uh, this guy, you know, gay guy, I'm getting him off the jury because what? He may go this way or that way. Uh -huh. and your black guy, definitely, you know, the prosecutor's black guy, get him off. Unless sometimes, well, you know, maybe uh, somebody with a uh, sympathetic to crime and it comes from a high crime area, we'll keep him on. So in other words, they make snap judgments all the time. And I got to tell you something. I'm so far... I think Pritzker has done a really great job as governor. I think he's done a really great job. I'm yeah. not a perfect person. <laughs> That's okay. You can not be perfect. That's okay. Okay, so you do a little yeah. shenanigans with the toilets. Yeah. Okay, fine. That was before he became governor. Before right? That's fine. Yeah. I wonder where Rounder is. Is he crying in one of his nine homes? <laughs> I believe he Nobody loves one. me anymore. Was it nine or eight? Nine. Uh, okay, nine. Okay. All right. Two uh, of them are ranches. I think he sold one. That's He sold the one in Winnetka, but don't quote me on that. I think he sold the one in Winnetka. So now he has... Uh, Eight? It, uh, no, he uh, eight homes. He has now six homes and two ranches. Okay, wow. Didn't, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's the ranches where he was drinking wine with Rom. Remember that? That's right, the, the one in Montana. Wine. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think uh, uh, Pritzker has uh, done a good job so far, but this will be a pivotal year for uh, Pritzker 2020. Uh, the whole issue of the fair tax, we'll be talking about it throughout the year. Uh, that will be a defining moment. Did someone for him. say Bruce Rauner? Yay for our teachers! <laughs> Yay for our teachers! Nine down, <laughs> eleven more to go. It's the twenty new laws of twenty twenty, brought to you by well WTTW Chicago. They really did <laughs> well. All they're the not work really. There. They didn't bring. Uh, it's not brought to us by. You know what I mean? Like they didn't sponsor it. Oh look, guys, if you want to sponsor our show, oh man, yeah, call please. Doctor D anytime. Please. We'd love to read stuff off your website if you pay us. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah. But hey. Nine more to go. It's the 20 new laws of 2020 right here on the Ben Jarofsky Show. All right. Very good. Uh, we're going to uh, take a break. Another we're going to end the show for the day. Uh, and then after uh, Dennis does the wheeling and dealing he does at the board. Wait, so are we taking a break or are we ending the show? Ending the show. Okay, uh, cool. I, I was thinking in terms of Sergio and I are taking a break because oh, we're going to okay. take the deep right, dive. All right. But we will end the show, today's show. Great show it was. I want to thank Sergio Mims, and I want to thank Leonard Goodman. That was a great conversation with Leonard Goodman, civil uh, liberties lawyer. Uh, you know, in retrospect, I wish I had brought Leonard Goodman on to talk to you about Twitter. That'd be interesting to get his thoughts on no, another day. Uh, another day. Uh, and we're definitely going to have to get Leonard Goodman on with Monroe Anderson someday and see those two battle it out over uh, Russiagate. But anyway, thank Leonard Goodman for coming by. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend, as Sergio can tell you, back home in, uh, in Alton, they call him White Lightning. Give yourself a raise. <laughs> take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Well, I wonder if he'll stop saying that in 2020. Probably not. And remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else you download your favorite podcast. Downloaders, we live stream this program. It's true. Tuesdays through Fridays, 1 until 3 p.m. Central Time. Once again, at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel. Ben just threw a bagel at Sergio. And hey, we're going to be talking with Sergio, the top movies of the decade. What were they? Well, you're going to have to stick around to find out and have it. we'll have it available for download at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites. That sounds like we'll, we'll probably do that on Saturday. They're eating bagels. All right, guys, we're done. See ya.